to today's session. Hope all of you are doing well. My name is Mohamad Muzammil and I'll be your MC tonight. Yeah. 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 To those. Oh, who, hi, Maya. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Now I'll be talking a bit about our club's objective, which is to bridge the gap between tech education and academia, industry and entrepreneurship. So those who are share the sim uh, similar interests, please do sign up to our club and be a member to get access to exclusive events. Yeah, next. Yeah, so uh, these are the things that we conduct in Sunway Tech Club, just the brief things where we conduct workshops and these are the sessions dedicated to learning various technologies. And also, we also have talk with the main goal is to educate participants about the various topics that is currently tre trending in the tech industry. And lastly, we have meetups, which are sessions organized with a focus on network, networking, sharing, and learning between all the tech enthusiasts. Yeah. So, I would welcome once again to all to the main event, Sunway Tech Club Python workshop. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, now I do like to introduce our speakers for tonight. Our first speaker will be Xiong Yang, and he has worked previously with us and he has conducted the Sunway Tech Club Python workshop for the 2020. And also he's a Python enthusiast. For our following speaker will be Ethan Oi, who is an who has worked as machine in machine learning at Microsoft as a data scientist at Axiata and currently now is an AI developer at Regurf Technologies. Yeah. So to those beginners who are just starting out from week zero to week three, these are the things that we'll be covering, where we'll be learning about what is Python, what does it do and who is it for, and how to start using Python with Google, Google Collab, which is an IDE, and also some, Python, some fun Python models to start with. Yeah. And if you are already in from week four onwards, then yeah, to those intermediates and all, we'll be also learning about linear regression, fundamentals of machine learning, and autoencoders. Yeah, to those participants who ask any questions, right, please scan the QR code and send your questions through there. And if you guys aren't able to scan the QR code, then we'll be also sending the slider code in the chat box so you guys can, can get it from there. And also, you can approach our teaching crew, who will be Sean, Gregory, and Megan. So in the participants, you can see like co-hosts, you can find their names. If you have any like personal questions, you can send them. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'll pass it to Xiong Yang to speak now. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Okay, good. Thanks Dr. M. Guys, welcome to yet another quality event by STC. My name is Xiong Yang and I will be your presenter this evening for basic yeah. Python and linear regression. The first question I, that I must ask is, why even code? Yeah, guys, don't we have apps for everything already? So who am I and why did I get myself into coding? Python is special to me, Python, because it fills a gap in my workflow. And these days, I'd rather spend lots of time coming up with code rather than to do something rep repetitively. Yeah? Uh, about, about 10 years ago, I did uh, C++ in high school uh, because it was a compulsory part of uh, computer studies anyway, uh, in computer lesson. Uh, but we weren't able to connect the dots. You see, we were taught hello world, yeah, and building a simple calculator with C++. But we never got to know how to join the dots from creating hello world, building simple calculator to programming stuff awesome stuff like Warcraft 3, GTA Vice City, 
Adobe software and uh, also Apple, Apple operating system is built on C++ as well. You see, I was introduced to coding at age 11. Uh, I had a, a brilliant uh, computer tuition teacher who taught me how to write HTML in Notepad. You see, that was mind blowing for me. You know, it was, it was even more interesting than going through what I did in high school because I saw it put into practice. Uh, and, uh, but of course there's a bit of a hiatus uh, my journey really started, my journey in programming started uh, really with, uh, with Excel. Yeah, it is probably one of the early baby steps to learn about code structure. Uh, and then eventually, uh, two workshops in Excel later, we decided that it would be fun to maybe revive the Python workshop uh, in the middle of the pandemic. And, uh, and, and so we had Python workshop 2020 last year. Uh, I'm by no means a technical coder. Uh, I wouldn't even consider myself an enthusiast because that means I would, I would know a lot, okay? Uh, that completely mistakes my abilities. However, I would say I'm a hobbyist uh, in that I would shop for code and then repurpose them for my projects. As mentioned last year, I am a master copy and paster. Uh, today, I shall teach you my style of learning and how to learn it quick and how to learn it dirty. With this, question, yeah? why even code? Uh, back to this question. Why even code? Don't we have apps for everything already? Uh, I'd like to do a bit of a survey with you guys. What is your main motivation for learning Python? Uh, you can react with your uh, emoticons. You can select the reactions at the bottom of your screen. Uh, is it because your motivation for learning Python, is it because someone has, has told you about it? Uh, who did it because someone told you about Python that you should learn? React, you can thumbs up, you can put a smiley or whatever, let us know. Is it because someone told you about it? All right. Or is it because of money that you want to learn Python? The promise of making a lot of money because you know how to code. Can I speak with uh, via microphone? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because it is interesting for me to uh, actually view that, uh, actually view the a kind of program that I have, uh, I have code, I have uh, already coded and uh, run via some platforms. Yeah, like for example, when I created a kind of like uh, game gaming programs uh, with coding with, with coding via Python, and when it really runs and I can move it, it's really interesting it really stimulates my motivation. So that's why. Awesome. Nice to hear from you, uh, Sato. So you belong to the category of those uh, for the hacking and engineering thrill of coding, right? We all have our motivations I to, to, thanks Sato. We all have our motivations to learning code. But here, let me just tell you a story if uh, that hasn't quite sunk in yet. We have a story with a few words, a few words which I would like to show on my screen. The first word is caveman. Yeah, you've got caveman. How do you tell the story with caveman? Fire. Cooking. And Gordon Ramsay. Although that's probably not his real name because Gordon is a bit misspelled there. How do you tell the story with these four words? Well, it's a bit of a metaphor, I would say. Being consumers, we are the cavemen. We don't really care how technology works as long as it does what we bought them for, right? Uh, Python is one of the things that is always in our collective consciousness. So it's like, it's like we talk about Python as cavemen, we talk about Python, but uh, it's kind of like cavemen talking about lightning. Like you don't know, what it is, uh, and uh, if you once you're involved in it, then you'll see that it's completely a uh, different animal. Uh, and, and then we head on to fire, the story of fire. Uh, learning how to program is like learning how to start a fire. Uh, we have got lighters, we have got gas stoves, uh, and ovens and toasters, the function is the same. It's used to cook, uh, and it's used to light our homes, but we, we now appreciate the effort, you see, if you know how to code, you appreciate the effort that's gone into inventing and manufacturing uh, the items, the apps that we use 
every day. Cooking with fire. Cooking with fire is like practicing your programming skills by developing scripts uh, or apps. It may not taste great. Yeah, you might burn yourself, but uh, if it works, it is definitely not stupid. Yeah, Gordon Ramsay can smoke vegetables. Yeah, but he doesn't grow his own greens. He he might have started uh, if you if you look at the image, he might have started prepping dinner at four twenty p.m. But his famous beef Wellington uh, still had ingredients bought from the supermarket. Yeah, if this goes to show that if you have modules and scripts readily available. Just use your eyes, use your mouse, plagiarize. When using a high level language like Python, you do not, I repeat, you do not reinvent the wheel. Instead, you build upon what others have already constructed for that purpose. In this next slide, we ask ourselves, why use Python? The industry prides itself on being uh, very grounded in Java and C++. Uh, can I have a show of hands on who identifies as maybe a, a HTML or JavaScript person? If you've got your video on, show me your hands. If not, you could react with a thumbs up. Are you a HTML JavaScript person? Okay, I see a few. How about Java person? Any, any, Java, any Java people in the audience? Okay, C++, okay. Or, or SQL, any SQL or Visual Basic in the house? Okay, great. See, for, for anyone who's used uh, something else, okay, and use Python, I think you can all agree that Python is a lot like English, uh, which has influences from other languages. Python borrows a bit from C. Uh, in fact, I think it's built upon C. It borrows from Java and uh, SQL. It, it borrows a bit here and there. Uh, and, and that's why I think it's like English because it's a high level uh, programming language that uses uh, the nuances from other uh, languages as well. One of the I have, I've got three pointers on why anyone uh, would use Python. The first would be FANG. So what is FANG? These are the biggest tech companies on the surface planet. Their combined uh, market capitalization is about 3% of the entire world's GDP. So you had five companies representing 3% of the global, of the entire planet's wealth. According to Google, they, Python where they can, and they see plus plus where they must. So programming languages are just as fluid as real languages. You have mini projects in all of these big companies, uh, even though they might not be using a lot of Python, but mini projects. In some cases like Facebook, they use 21% of Python in their code, which is a lot. Uh, I see Cheryl has uh, her hand raised. Hi uh, Cheryl, Any, uh, you have a question? Okay, all right, so moving on, yeah? Uh, and because of that, Python is, uh, is widely used, I would say, because of its uh, ability to wrangle big data and also because a lot of big companies, small companies adopt it. It's widely used, widely supported, and it is also easy to, easy to read and it's easy to also learn, yeah? And take a part for debugging and testing. Why, do, why did I say that? If you have used Java, for instance, uh, I, I think you can compare two lines, uh, uh, two lines of Python, all right, to do something that takes 10 lines in Java. So you save a lot in terms of your, uh, your programming speed. Yeah, in, in modern computing, you might say that Python, oh well, Python runs a little slower than Java, yeah, because it's got a lot of dependencies, but, uh, with modern computers, I don't think that's going to be a big issue unless, you know, you're talking about bigger scale projects. And libraries. Uh, when you talk about Python, you must always, always have a bit of, uh, save a bit of the chapter for libraries. Python has over 100,000 libraries. And what 
are these libraries? Libraries are modules whereby you could have specific uh, usage for uh, these certain modules that do certain things. And that means 137,000 libraries, you have 137,000 applications already being developed to solve every problem imaginable. And I've used no fewer than 60 references here in preparing for this workshop. So it also goes the extra mile to say that Python has a very supportive user base. And it's always, uh, the community is always growing. You're always getting new material and it's easy to learn in such an environment. As someone new to coding and new to Python, uh, here are some of uh, my very real train of thoughts, I would say, uh, on coding in this language. Uh, some emotions and uh, some thoughts here yeah, of someone starting out in Python or coding. When you're doing, when you're learning a programming language for the first time, you're guaranteed to feel bored. Yeah, bored because you can't see the use cases for many of the beginner lessons yeah, that you have on the internet or whether it's, uh, it, it, it's in an e-lecture, uh, tutorial, because you can't see uh, that far up ahead. Yeah? It takes a wider uh, picture to appreciate. And uh, you got to know a lot of things in order to see how uh, Python code can fall in place. So as you're starting out, you might feel bored. Uh, why should I do Hello World, uh, for instance? Yeah? Uh, you might feel uh, uh, confused or scared as well. Um, because there's no, there's no GUI, there's no interface for you to interact with. It's just a terminal. And uh, what you do is you just type stuff in. You get confused because there's nowhere to click or drag. Uh, you might be scared to change variables. And you might even get memory conscious. What I mean by memory conscious is that every Python tool and module has to be separately downloaded. Uh, you'll realize that when you start installing Python to your PC. It's not just Python data you're going to install. You gotta install an IDE. And once you have an IDE, when you start coding in Python, you got to start downloading all the modules that you'll be using. Modules out of the 137,000 libraries that I spoke about earlier. You might also feel stuck because you might not know the term, you're just starting out. You might not know which module to use. You might be lost for words on how to describe your problem. Uh, which is why uh, you probably spend a lot of time as a beginner looking through Stack Overflow. Any of you guys know what Stack Overflow is? Give a thumbs up. Right. As a programmer, as a computer science student, or in fact anyone who is interested in learning how to code should abuse Stack Overflow. And once you've gotten over that stage, uh, maybe you'll start feeling excited, yeah? Why, why excited? Because you've successfully ran your first code. It solved the problem, it saved you time. And that's when you feel excitement and the curiosity on how to use what you've learned to solve bigger and wider problems. Programming, just a basic uh, breakdown of programming. Uh, the, the, the running joke is that machine learning uh, and uh, programming, machine learning, uh, basically machine learning and AI is just a bunch of if statements. Uh, I think uh, I think that's partially true, but uh, I think I'll let I'll let Ethan uh, share with you the intricacies of machine learning. It it goes a bit more than that, uh, but the principle remains the same. You program a machine so that when you send an input and you get the machine to give you an output, that's basically what programming is. And you do it on a continuous basis if it's in machine learning and your program gets, gets smarter and smarter and it adapts to newer problems. Okay. So what do we have here? We have uh, the major modules. Uh, what do I mean by major modules? Major modules, well, we're not going to be, think of it as uh, this, this next chapter is that we're going to be taking a visit to uh, an aquarium. Yeah, we're going to be visiting an aquarium. We're not going to be swimming with the, uh, the sharks and the stingrays. 
we're gonna learn as much as we can. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be in that queue going through the aquarium. We're gonna we're gonna have a 360 degree view of uh, of the language. Yeah, we're gonna try and do as much as we can, learn a bit uh, about the various functions of the Python language and its many many modules. Uh, and then, of course, if you do have Q and A's, which most definitely you would, uh, we encourage, please, uh, as uh, Musama mentioned, uh, feel free to approach uh, any of our teaching assistants. You can put it in the chat box. You can go to our Slido. And if uh, you would like, if after the event you would like to ask questions, you could bring it to our Facebook, or you could create a Stack Overflow uh, and uh, take your questions on from there. Yeah, uh, submit your questions, and uh, uh, you know. If you have faith in humanity, yeah. Uh, if you've lost faith in humanity, yeah, Stack Overflow completely restores it. I guarantee your question will definitely be answered by someone uh, in the far corners of the earth. Our first, our first module. Uh, okay, sorry. First of all, uh, Colab guys, have you have you opened uh, your Colab already? As mentioned in our uh, event description. Uh, if you don't. Please uh, go to this site here, this collab.research.google.com. Uh, and uh, we've also got a lesson file for you once you've signed in to your collab. We have it on chat. Uh, guys, will you be pasting the uh, the link in the chat? You guys, know where to find our lesson files? Okay. Uh, lesson lesson files. Eh? Okay, perhaps I will share, I'll share the lesson file link with you guys. Uh, those of you who have the, who are using your PCs, you can click into this link. It's a bit of a long link. Uh, once you've accessed it, uh, give us a thumbs up to let us know. Okay, Sato. All right, Magi. Okay, Badis. All right, Maho. Okay, Venon. All right. Okay, great. Let's take about 10 more seconds uh, just to click the link, and uh, you should be greeted with uh, a Colab notebook. All right. Okay. Uh, let me just let me just go to the uh, the Colab notebook and uh, maybe I'll explain a few things. I'll exit the slides from here and uh, there we go. So this is our our notebook. All right. Uh, we can see is we've got uh, lots of code, uh, lots of text, and what a notebook is uh, like. Like even as a Google user for the longest time, uh, I've never heard of Colab. Right? The uh, the release of this Colab has been has been very very discreet, as though they are trying to hide it. Yeah, there's a big chance that you, for the uh, longest time, a Gmail user, would never have heard of this. Uh, this Colab is actually uh, what uh, Musamil has mentioned is an IDE. Uh, what an IDE is, it's, uh, it stands for Integrated Development Environment. Uh, the biggest difference here is that IDEs, um, why, okay, why would you use an IDE? Okay, why would you use an IDE and not uh, like something like Notepad, right? Uh, because you can see that your IDEs allow you to run your code on the spot. Uh, it also allows you to handle uh, exceptions. 
and it allows you to uh, automate your inputs. Uh, later, we'll see how uh, the automation takes place. Uh, for instance, if you were to uh, just give it a quote and the second quote mark will automatically appear. This is what we mean by automation. It's a small uh, parcel of it. Uh, we've used uh, a lot of IDEs uh, you know, uh, in our events, uh, like VS Code last year. Last year, it was all on VS Code. Uh, and our web launch event, which is uh, coming real soon, uh, previously, we've used Sublime, the text editor, Sublime uh, text editor for that. A uh, lot of lots of IDEs out there. And what makes Colab so special is that it is run on a virtual uh, computer uh, at no impact to your own hardware. It won't be limited by how much RAM or disk space that you have on your current PC. And it's built on top of the, uh, uh, the, the Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, the Jupyter Notebook supports uh, 40 other languages, but Colab is more like lightweight edition of it. Uh, it's used for machine learning, data analysis, and education. Uh, and the main language that it serves is Python, fortunately. And uh, it works from top to bottom. Uh, if you scroll, uh, spoilers ahead, you know, if you scroll, you can see uh, just what I meant by that, yeah, top to bottom. Okay, and back to our slides. The first, uh, the first module which we'll be touching on is Turtle. Uh, if you go here, uh, Turtle, okay, and there's two, three, four, and all the way down there. Okay, I'm just gonna give a brief intro on each and one of them before we dive straight into the notebook. Present, there we go. All right, <laughs> MS Word Programmer. So Turtle, uh, Turtle is just like, uh, the, I'm not sure if you guys have played this as a kid, or, or maybe you still have it now. It's, uh, it's like the etch and sketch. Uh, it's like a board and you turn knobs and uh, the thing draws in the, the tablet. And then uh, it draws with like uh, you know, some, magnet, some magnets. Yeah. Uh, it's like an etch and sketch, but it's done, it's done in a computer and uh, you don't get to use your mouse. All right. Okay. Awesome. Uh, it brings back memories, doesn't it? Uh, for those who've been through like uh, uh, robotic lessons, you program uh, the turtle to draw. Uh, it's the version that we're going to be using here is, uh, is a weaker version uh, adapted for Colab. Uh, there's actually a full version, proper version of it for uh, the desktop IDEs. Uh, Colab, unfortunately, you can't, uh, you can't interact with it that much. A lot of uh, GUI modules are not uh, compatible with Colab. Yeah, triangle and uh, house turtles. You can draw a lot of stuff with turtle. I'll show you in just a bit. The next module that we'll be touching on is Wikipedia. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, Wikipedia, you will know that you know you could basically find anything, yeah, and almost anything on uh, Wikipedia. Uh, it's a handy tool to make your Wikipedia searches uh, which, without having to go to Wikipedia. Uh, and then the, my, favorite, my favorite aspect of this Wikipedia module is the fact that you can summarize. You can summarize uh, your search. Okay? Sometimes you go to a page, you see just too many lines. You use this Wikipedia module, it will summarize that search item in as many sentences as you want. Uh, it still requires some work. Uh, later, we'll, we'll see why. Uh, it still requires some work because not everything is yet available on Wikipedia. So there's, uh, there's quite a number of things you can uh, look up on Wikipedia. Mm. Uh, the next module would be uh, our Chatterbot. Uh, Chatterbot is, well, it's, like your, it's like your DIY uh, uh, Back in the day, we used to have something called the Smarter, Smarter Child Chatbot. Yeah, that was like my very first chatbot that I've interacted with. Smarter Child, and then there was, uh, uh, think of it as programming your own, your own uh, bender, yeah, bender, bender, bending, or you guess that uh, uh, it says whatever you want it to. Uh, it also in the product description, it is, uh, it is said to be a natural, language uh, evaluator and uh, it allows you to compute uh, math functions as well. So it's uh, kind of like a, a multi-purpose chatbot. 
and then you could train it by feeding continuous in a, a continuously feeding info into the chatbot. Uh, a lot of if statements, yeah, a lot of if statements. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, pandas as well. We'll, we'll be doing pandas. Uh, so those of you who might have heard of uh, the song Panda by uh, this rapper, this American rapper designer, if you if you listen very carefully uh, to the lyrics, his lyrics, you're like, you know, Panda, Panda, Panda. Yeah. He, had, he actually isn't, you know, he, he actually isn't singing about the Python data analysis library, uh, which is what this is, yeah. Uh, this Pandas and Matplot, Lip, uh, whatever, it, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, these are like the, uh, the left and right arm of uh, Python's uh, very own uh, Excel. They are like the data structuring, uh, analysis, uh, visualization tools. Mm. And uh, they're kind of like Excel, but just that they don't crash that often. But if you love Pandas and Matplotlib, uh, make sure to stay tuned for our Excel workshops here yeah, when it drops. We've got an Excel workshop. Ah. Pillow, uh, pillow. So, pillow. When I when I think of pillow, I I think of like soft things, uh, soft, like you know. It, and I could probably imagine, uh, maybe just as you would, that this module is probably doing soft, soft, soft things, like uh, maybe generating uh, like ASMR sounds or like. Uh, brushing your cat, you know, soft, soft stuff. Huh? But Pillow is actually like uh, the Adobe Lightroom of Python is for manipulating images. Uh, and you can import images, you can blur images, brighten images, and, and you can export them as different formats. Uh, for, for all of its functions, I think it's best that you refer to the, uh, the Python uh, imaging, I think it's Python imaging library, PIL. Uh, and uh, just refer, just look up the official documentation for uh, what this pillow uh, thingamajig is. Uh, right. Yes, hi. Any comments from the floor? Uh, Jiggy? Okay, I think you might have accidentally unmuted yourself. But that's okay. We'll, we'll we'll go straight into the uh, the notebook here. Yeah? If you all have already accessed this uh, notebook, please make sure to go to the top under file and save a copy in your drive. That way you can edit the notebook and uh, still retain a copy. This notebook, by the way, is our gift to you. Uh, do what you want with it. Majority of today's lesson will be done just using this notebook. It's fantastic. Google Colab, yeah. And we need a bit of a warm up. Uh, if you are already an advanced user of Python, please excuse uh, five to ten minutes. We're gonna take you through some uh, maybe revise or you know for the benefit of our our beginners uh, here in our uh, workshop to go through some basic functions of Python, how you can print stuff and how you can input stuff. And yes, uh, save a copy, that's right. And, uh, thanks, always save a copy because if, uh, if you don't, um, I don't think you'll be able to edit. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do is gonna print the hello world. Uh, forget what I said about the hello world and all, you know, you can't connect the dots and everything. Just try your best to print the hello world. And uh, if you look at this code right here, there's this code and there's also a play button. Uh, that means you should press it. Let's press this code and see what happens. Oh dear, it says that your, uh, your hello is not defined. Well, uh, something that you should know is that it doesn't work that way yeah you can't just print and you know input something uh python is a little different yeah so if you say oh hello is not defined okay let's define hello how do we define hello huh? 
we, we just define it, right? Okay, if I say hello means uh, hello, right? Right? I've defined it. But yet, it says it's not defined. It's, it's not truly defined because you put hello and equals to hello and then it's it, it, it's just going to be never-ending. Yeah? Hello equals hello. The, the kicker here is, ladies and gentlemen, is not that it's not defined, but rather we forgot to add a certain few things. So if you select, you highlight the hello and shift and apostrophe you know, to get the, the quotes, the double quotes, uh, you should get something like this. Okay, another feature of Colab, okay, the automation part that I told you about. Yeah, just press play. And there you go, you've printed your first uh, hello, okay? And, uh, and that's the end of the workshop, right? Of course, we're gonna do more interesting things than that, right? Next, we'll be moving on into input. What's the point of the, uh, of the computer? Uh, mentioning something to you, speaking to you, if you're not able to, you know, give it some, uh, give it your peace of mind, right? For want of a better word. Uh, now we introduce the input where you can interact with the computer. You could call this anything. Uh, this, by the way, guys, if you were to assign uh, an equals and uh, whatever that comes before it doesn't really matter. Uh, unless it conflicts with an existing module. Uh, but what we can start off with is maybe just call this, uh, okay, what does the fox say? Fox say uh, anything works, right? It's just a variable. Uh, don't beat yourself over it. And, and then you have this input, okay? Uh, the benefit of having this is that you don't have to type this all out. Uh, you can just uh, play it and it works like magic. Okay. Let's just try the first line. Okay. The two lines here, what you can do is you can perhaps uh, comment it. To comment, guys, uh, I'm just going to put this in the, uh, in the chat to comment. Highlight your code and press and hold control slash. That should comment your tag, your, your uh, comment your code, and that way it doesn't run. Once you've done that, you press play, and then this Foxy will work. And here we have this nifty input box, and uh, just tell it whatever, A, B, C, D, F, whatever, right? And and there you've already communicated with uh, the computer. But there's a, there's a bit of a problem, uh, you're just, you're just communicating with the computer, but uh, you're getting no outputs. Yeah. Now we're gonna make the computer speak back to us. And how are we gonna do that? We could we could start maybe with a print, and instead we uh, remove the the quotes and have it print Foxy, because guys, Foxy is already defined. It's already defined here. Okay. And if you press play. Say I want the fox to, uh, what does the fox say? I, you know, whatever. Yeah. And then that's my reply from the computer who has absorbed what I've input and has output fox say, yeah, fox say. We modify, we further modify the code uh, in order for uh, there to be uh, other parts to that statement. Uh, otherwise, all you get is just this simple, uh, you know, inelegant output of just what you've keyed in. Uh, maybe it would look nicer if you could have like some, uh, some context, right? How you would normally start and end a sentence. Maybe you could add this in, the fox says, okay. And then followed by what you've keyed in and it ends there, right? Uh, okay, we can try that. Now that we've uncommented, we'll press play again, see what happens. It's not churning out, as you can see, it's not churning out our input. Our input was this uh, ya, ya, ya. Okay, it's supposed to be ya, 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 
but all we are getting is this uh, strange brackets thing. Well, ladies and gentlemen, remember, if you were to print anything at all, uh, you always start and end with quote marks, yeah? In this case, we have started and we have ended with quote marks. Unfortunately, this dismisses the fact that uh, even though we would want quote marks within the quote marks, it doesn't work that way. Uh, Python just couldn't interpret the quote marks uh, if you were to stack them on top of each other. As an alternative, you could use the apostrophe, which is single quote, Uh, code, code's not running, the play button keeps loading. Uh, maybe, maybe you might have skipped a few steps. Uh, or if, uh, if all else goes wrong, you could restart. You could go to this. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yep. Change your Wi-Fi. Or you could uh, connect. You could go to runtime. And uh, you could restart your runtime. It, what? This essentially does is that it restarts your notebook and then uh, you should be able to run the code as if you've opened it for the first time because uh, one thing to note when using this notebook later we'll be doing some refreshing because if you were to open you play 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 and then uh, what you get is that you have all these variables all stacked up uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of these variables which you don't want it future code blocks at the bottom so we'll have to we'll have to restart the runtime okay cool right thanks yeah thanks thanks Barbara. and okay replace the double quote with the single quote we'll do that for this and uh, because we want the double quote in the string that we're printing out we will leave this one we'll spare this and we'll close that with a single quote okay and then we print in place of string, we will print foxy, yeah, fox, foxy. And then we will end it with the double quote, also in single quotes here, yeah, before and after it. Let's press A. Here we are. And there we go. That's how you can print double quotes in your Python script. Uh, all clear so far? All clear. Uh, any questions, you can put it in the chat box or the Slido as we move along. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, okay. Now we've got, uh, now we're testing some if statements. Okay, we're gonna do a bit about if statements. Uh, for instance, if you have this print over here, uh, like hangman game, huh? hangman game, fill in the blanks. The answer is, how would you get the user to input the answers? Guys, what's the, what's the code we use for the machine to accept uh, user inputs? You please leave it in the comments. Good. Yes, Bernice is right. Uh, Zachary, yep, input. Excellent. So it is, input it is, yeah? Input, fill in the blanks above. This technically is okay. And we move on to, let's let's just test it out, shall we? Let's test it out, okay? Let's play to see if it works. Yep, it's printing this, and then it fills in the blanks above, and then we type whatever, and uh, there's, there's no output because we haven't specified it yet. So now we are going to be specifying the output of, uh, of an if statement. Uh, we're not going to be doing any coding here because it's already been prepared for you. I can assure you that this code works. Uh, the if at the beginning is just like plain English, right? If, if your answer, if your answer equals trap, equal the key in trap instead of this SDA, whatever, you will get the answer. You are correct. Otherwise, else you're wrong let's test it out yeah press the play and then oops what is up here if answer equals trap that by right should work right if it's equals then it, it should work right mm, here's the funny thing here's another funny thing about uh python if you want to use an if statement it has to be 
with double equals. Press play, and you see my, the key in track. Yes, it accepts my input. Yes, it's able to connect answer to my input. Likewise, if I wanted to try the uh, the else, okay, to see if this works, I will run the code again. And when I do, I will key in something other than track. You are wrong, you see? That, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of how an if statement is. And if and else, if you have more than one input, you could always use an elif answer equals maybe, um, yeah, maybe we'll say part, right? And print, uh, you are correct, uh, times two. Okay. Just so we're able to distinguish which uh, if statement it has invoked. If I press type in part, yes, it shows me the elif, which is the other if. You guys can follow through, you can put this in and uh, and use this for future reference if you want. Yeah. Okay, uh, that that was the if statement. Uh, any questions, uh, you can put in the chat box or the slide though, yeah? Uh, okay, uh, Wendy, your, your frog say didn't work. Okay, can you briefly describe, can you briefly come on audio and describe your issue? Yes, I believe uh, others it might be facing. It says the file, line three says print, print the. I when think line three has an error. Oh, okay. Uh, if you were to inspect this, maybe it's because you were using uh, double quotes instead of single quotes. And why, why did we do this is because we wanted the double quotes to show in our uh, print. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so if you use single quotes instead of double quotes, then I think your code should work. Okay, uh, all good. Uh, if not, we'll just uh, we'll just progress, and then uh, we have time at the end of the session to take all the questions. Uh, not to worry. And the next we would like to go through is your uh, the speed module. Okay, what does this mean from time import sleep? It is, as you guys can see, still in comment form. Time import sleep, what does that mean, right? Does it mean Python goes to sleep? Sleeping Python? This number equals input, I think you would know what it means, yeah? It means you input a number and then it does this, right? Okay. Uh, we'll come back uh, to the uh, answers to the questions shortly. Uh, we appreciate your patience. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it for the end of the segment because uh, we're, we're covering some ground here. We still got a lot of modules to go through and uh, we'll be back, no problem. Uh, okay, just have some faith in this, uh, Tanju. Okay, so number equals uh, input. That means you key in a number, right? It, it is there, it's stated specifically how the output should be. And then you would have also this over here, which is current in co currently in comments. And uh, what this does, uh, as you will see, uh, will become apparent later. I won't, I won't, I won't spoil it for you. And uh, let's just say, yep, we unblock this and uh, some things you need to adjust here. Yeah. So instead of this print uh, I, okay, uh, let's just uh, block that away. Uh, we wouldn't have to know that for now. So price is up ahead. Key in the number. Uh, okay, I will key in the number. I will key in one, two, three. And what it does is that it said it is an str object and it cannot be interpreted as an integer. Uh, okay, for the benefit of our new users here, a string object, an str object is a string object. Okay, a string object is something like a text here. Yeah? So obviously a text cannot be read as an integer, which is uh, which is a number, it can't be read as a number. To convert that from a string to an integer, we use an integer and in brackets, we put uh, whatever uh, our input or variable previously was. And then what it does is it converts our input or the original variable into an integer. 
and if you press play and key in a number yep type casting and there you go it prints out everything in the range yeah that is what this code is for uh, the reason why you would do that this uh, by the way is called a for loop uh, which will be used in our later modules you will see this for loop is in plain english for every item in this range so i would specify a range i would key in two that means that's my range okay it's got two uh, elements to work with one and two and then for every item in this range, I will print out that item. I'll print out that number. So you might you might ask, hey, why is it? Why does it start with zero? Guys, for your info, I don't really know the answer to that, uh, except that Python has a habit of starting with zero. And that's about it. The only way you can get around with this uh, is to add a one to it. Just give it a bit of a math spin and your zero becomes one. And so is the rest of uh, the items here in that range within that for loop. But I think it's going a bit too fast. Yeah, it's a bit too fast. If say I wanted this output to be a little more human like. Why so? Because if you were to try to automate uh, your logins to certain websites uh, and you realize that certain of uh, these websites have got inbuilt security functions. Uh, for example, if you were to key in uh, certain inputs too quickly, uh, it might disconnect you, it might buy you because uh, it's just not physically possible to key in uh, as a human at that speed. So it's trying to reject uh, potential bots, okay? And uh, that's why you need to factor in a bit of a buffer time to make the machine more human-like yeah, in its response. Uh, strength, uh, so, okay, string object, we would say string object cannot be interpreted as an integer. Yep. And that's why you need to, you need to provide it with uh, an integer at the front and then you put it in brackets, your variable. Yep, to convert it into an integer. So, okay, back to our uh, topic. Why do we need to make it more human-like, right? Uh, as mentioned before, it is to uh, avoid detection, yeah? Avoid detection to make some uh, make the bot more human-like. And then to do that, we have this uh, beautiful module, this time module. Uh, you can do a lot of other stuff with it, but, uh, you know, time itself is a library, it's a module. For our purposes today, we are just going to be looking at one book from this library, okay? And that book is Sleep. Uh, this function will allow Python to go to sleep for as much time as you specify. Let's try it out. You've uncommented this, and let's uncomment this. Okay? And this blank should be sleep. You'll try that, run the play, Give it a five, and then you see one, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So it's like there is a two second delay in between. And this is what happens when you add a sleep to it. It factors in that buffer. Um, interesting, maybe not. Well, that's that's what it is. That's, that's a bit of our warm up, yeah, guys? Uh, and with that, we will move into uh, something that we could actually play with, something that we can use. The first step, as we've explained in the slides, is the drawing tool, right? The drawing tool being Turtle. Sleep is the, yep, sleep is the buffer time, yep. Thanks for the question, GM. And uh, for Turtle, uh, the drawing tool, if you want to see it in action, Press the play and scroll down here. Okay. So what this turtle is doing is that it's drawing out a sketch, a sketch of something which we've uh, pre-programmed previously. 
it just does that, okay, uh, and draws our STC logo. And then with, uh, with Turtle, you're able to print text as well. You're able to print text and uh, you're able to show the turtle in the end. You're able to show and hide the turtle as you wish. Uh, we'll do a bit of a code review. Obviously, what uh, you've seen was the result of all of this code. Uh, it's quite mind-numbing if you were to uh, just start in the middle, but uh, you will see some sense to this code. Uh, the first being the right. So this right means that you're telling the turtle to pivot 30 degrees to the right, okay? 30 degrees to the right. And then to move forward by 30. So that's uh, that's what the right and the forward is, okay? Um, that's, I'm not gonna uh, delve too deep into this because uh, I, I believe this is something that will be best for us to explore in, in our own free time because you're able to draw a lot of stuff and do a lot of amazing stuff with this. Uh, there's also pan up, pan down function Go to is when you teleport the, uh, the turtle anywhere in the grid. And that grid uh, doesn't just show up magically. First, uh, remember when I said that as a beginner, you realize there are so many things that have to be downloaded. Yes. So, uh, yeah, you probably need to redo things a lot to get. Yep, correct. You got to keep uh, playing, uh, changing, adjusting. And that's just what we did. And to, to make our lives easier, we had speed. Yeah, we just change it. By default, it is rather slow. You can see every stroke being drawn. But if you were to change it to eight or 10, then it becomes relatively quick uh, to see the playback. The first, the first stage to using any module was as before, you would have to import okay, the module. If it, if it isn't available, that's when you would call the pip installer. Pip is a Python's inbuilt installer. Uh, what's amazing about the pip is uh, it was a culture shock to me in a way because uh, previously when I've installed things, it is always I went to a website and I downloaded the uh, zip file. I ran the executable, and that's when it gets committed to my program files. But but uh, this pip is unique. This pip takes directly from the official library, or in the case of this, uh, it's a Google Colab version. It takes it from uh, Togatam, right? It installs it installs this module uh, into into my machine. This is a virtual machine and it's installed this Colab Turtle into that machine and it is imported into this program file. Uh, it, it, it just requires one line of code. You know how fantastic is it? You won't have to search for it. You don't have to download, spend time waiting. Well, maybe you might have to wait, uh, but all of this takes place automatically. It unzips, unpacks and everything on its own. And then you initialize. And that's when the magic happens. Uh, and uh, something different from before, uh, this from time import sleep, you could see that it is from the time module, you're importing this sleep function. Here, what we're doing is we're from Colaptero, we're importing everything, this asterisk, uh, I think it means everything from Colaptero. And then from this, uh, and then from this, you'll be importing turtle as T. Why so? Uh, this is the substitute turtle with T. That way you wouldn't have to keep repeating turtle every time you put these babies in. Yeah. It could be a much longer code if you don't do this. That's why you import S. Uh, more to discover. There's a lot of functions going on right here. There's color, there's you could go up and down. Uh, you could you could try it now, you know. You could try it now if you if you want to. You could delete this whole thing and you could, you could try it and uh, see if it works. If it works, then uh, you've understood Turtle already. The next the next uh, module. I hope I'm not going too fast. Uh, but uh, if you've got any questions, please feel free to leave it for us at the end of uh, the session. Second module, second module, guys, is Wikipedia. Uh, the Wikipedia module. We're installing it as what this line is doing. We're then importing this Wikipedia module into our Colab. The results. The first, the first search that we're going to be performing 
on this block of code is you're going to be looking at Python. This is the expected output. You're supposed to get this, okay, if you were to run the code. Let's see what happens. Uh, this was the first error that we encountered, remember? An undefined variable. And so how do we define it? We've already defined it. it. It is result, and that is what we want to print. So we'll just copy this. So if you type this in, result, and it will print the result. Otherwise, what you'll get is just this. If, say, I, I, I didn't print anything and I just ran the code, you will get nothing. In order for you to display the output, you'll have to print the error, which is the result. And there you go. So this is the desired output. And it comes when the Wikipedia module, okay, this is the code in plain English. The Wikipedia module has, uh, has got a summary tool. Okay, this is its summary tool. Uh, just like how when we are using time, we've got sleep. And this is just like that. You've got your time, you've got your sleep. Okay, the, the library and then the book followed by the code that's supposed to run on this book, which is there is a, there is a structure to it. Uh, to learn the structure, you will have to go to the official project page. Uh, you might even have to read the, uh, the documentation to know what the structure is. But generally, as we're laying it out right now before you, is that the first is your input. You're looking for Python. And you want to summarize the search as one sentence. If you change this to say maybe three and you press play, you will get three sentences. Yeah. Okay. So that's that. Uh, if you were to run uh, this second code uh, block for Wikipedia, you will see this uh, my list. Okay, this is something new for uh, those of you who are just starting out. Uh, a list is a combination, uh, a group, a group of uh, a group of elements, a group of I guess you can say that a group of elements. So it's like a string, but it's a, a string of strings. If if you get what I mean, it's a string of strings, and to package it, you have these brackets at the beginning and at the end. Uh, what this does is that it, if you were to search my list one, it will look through this my list one. You will look through Python first and Java, the Java programming language. Okay, so that is uh, that is a list, and that's how. Uh, okay, and how are we gonna use this uh, this list? Pretty simple. We first have to open up a form you know, type, uh, construct our for loop as before. And uh, instead of range, which we've done with our earlier uh, example, we're gonna be doing for i in my list one, right? Which is this, I'm running the for loop for the list. And this i can be anything. Guys, this i can be anything. Doesn't have to be i, it can be a. And uh, uh, initially what I was so, what, what Flex me so much was that there are, there, are, there are programmers out there who use stuff like foo, bar, and, and, and bars I don't understand. I thought it was uh, a standard syntax, but in fact, it's just nonsense, right? You, can, you just put i and you will run magically. But please ensure that if you were to use i here, there has to be a corresponding change in the other i's within your for loop as when it's mentioned. So if you change it to ABC, make sure this is ABC and ABC. Otherwise, it wouldn't run at all. Uh, I'm going to print uh, my, my tick one. And there we go. Uh, what you see here is if I just remove this my tick one, and if I were to press play, what Python has done was that it has gone to Wikipedia, it's looked for Python, which is the first item in the list, and then it's gone to look for Java. There we go. Instead, it's, uh, this Java is a music genre, okay? And if I were to be a little more specific Java programming language, and that's when I get the definition of Java. Uh, I would challenge you to create a custom dictionary of five words, maybe not a dictionary yet, okay? Uh, maybe just looking up 
five items and to do that you will you will extend this list okay um or the remedy maybe or remedy and um, uh well what what else could i look for one mdb one mdb uh, okay, there's a question on what my dick one is. So, uh, so my dick one is uh, a dictionary. Okay, and how do you define a dictionary? A dictionary is a little different from a list. A list, you use square brackets. For dictionary, it begins and it ends with curly braces. Uh, the reason why you would want to use a dictionary, as I'll quickly demonstrate here, guys, you don't have to follow. I'll quickly demonstrate here. Uh, I will unblock this and I'll unblock this. Okay, and then I will just run the code. I'll run the code. And then, you see here what it does is that, oops, what's up here? Result sentences one. Okay, you will get this. Remember when I said Wikipedia, this module is still a work in progress. It says here that it's not able to find one MSN. It's not able to find one MSN. And so maybe we have to be a, a little more uh, specific on the item which we want, uh, but uh, maybe we'll just remove this one MDB from here and focus on just these four items here. And we'll run this, and now you will see most likely that it will work perfectly because all the Ramsey is in Wikipedia. And uh, this right here, okay, this fourth item, we've only looked for four items one, two, three, four, fifth item here. Uh, why is it the second item in the list is Java, but the summary is Wikipedia uh, on Jazz? Well, that's because uh, this Wikipedia module uh, doesn't really know how to interpret. Uh, if you've used Wikipedia, you see that there is uh, uh, there is something known as an etymology, which means that there is a lot of things related to that word. So Java could mean Java coffee, Java the place in uh, Indonesia. It could mean Java as the music genre in this case. The first search yield, uh, yielded uh, Java, the music genre. So that's as simple as I can put it. Uh, and it just needs a lot more work, okay? You guys just need to contribute more to uh, Wikipedia and create uh, more of these uh, uh, amazing search criteria. And this fifth item, uh, guys, this back to the uh, topic of what this my dick is. Uh, my dick is a dictionary and it's taken all our inputs, okay? Being from Python, okay. What it does, what it did was that it's taken this ABC, my dick ABC, uh, it's added Python to the dictionary, and then it has also added result to the dictionary. And see, Python is an interpreter, you will see the same thing here, right? Python is an interpreter, da, da, da. and this is Python. And how do you use a dictionary, guys? How do you use a dictionary? Once you have a dictionary saved, uh, you will do this, yeah. Say I wanted to call up my dick one. Uh, I I no longer want to search uh, Wikipedia. So I will I'll, I'll block this. And I will just do a search on hmm, how many have we here got in Okay. I'll I'll try that. See if it works. Oh wait, not necessary. Let's just do that. See, because it's already saved, guys, remember when I said that uh, for, for, for certain things, you've got to reset the runtime. You see, if you don't reset the runtime, it's already saved uh, this my dick in uh, the runtime. And you can just call it out, yeah, as and when you want. So Gordon Ramsay, it, uh, you call out uh, Python, it will, it will print the summary. So it saved the local copy of your, uh, uh, your searches mm. like that. Uh, you say, for instance, uh, I wanted to change something. Okay, this is a bonus topic you don't have to follow. Uh, but if I wanted to change, like Gordon Ramsay, and uh, uh, I wanted to remove Gordon Ramsay, okay. Uh, earlier we saw uh, that was, uh, I think it was Snoop, Snoop Dogg, and uh, we will just uh, remove Gordon Ramsay and replace him with, yeah. With, uh, with, uh, and then we will print. And now, if we were to do a search uh, with uh, play, uh, it should show up not Gordon Ramsay, it should show up. Okay, 
So don't mind it. Oh, okay. Let me just unlock this. Magic one. Let's find it on top. Find it one. Yeah. So this is me searching the dictionary. Searching the dictionary for uh, Snoop Dogg, and uh, by right, it's supposed to be an error. Uh, I should unlock the whole thing. Run this code again. There we go. So now let me isolate this. That way we won't print anything. Uh, oh, sorry. Print this up. Unblock. Unblock this. Okay, to fix the error earlier. Okay, so what happened earlier was that because there was a, I think there was a runtime issue, uh, meaning that the program has gotten the uh, the Gordon Ramsay wrong. Okay, because I've already changed it with uh, Snoop Dogg, it's not able to find Gordon Ramsay anymore. And so therefore, I had to rerun the code from scratch so that it's going back to Wikipedia, doing the search for Gordon Ramsay again, uh, committing it to the dictionary, uh, doing the whole, all of the steps, and then uh, and then coming back to here. You see, you, you must have Gordon Ramsay in the list in order for you to, to change that list, uh, to change Gordon Ramsay from that list and add new dog in. So that's just what, it, what I did. And my initial error was that I have omitted the one. So if I omitted the one, then the my dig is not defined. It, it, it's not defined. Uh, and and so that will cause uh, an error. Uh, one of the one of the things that happens with coding is that you've got to continuously uh, you've got to continuously probe the code and uh, as they say uh, a code that's not tested is a code that doesn't work. So you have to keep keep testing the code. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this uh, there because uh, we've got a lot more to cover. Okay. Just chatterboard. Okay. We'll run through. Uh, we'll breeze easily uh, just press the play and see it in action okay we're not gonna go in detail we're not gonna go in detail on chatterboard uh okay it says here that when you ask when when life gives you diamonds keep calm and uh whatnot right so i'll just keep calm and yeah so it will it will, it will give me a predefined uh, response and you could play around with this uh, just by changing what's here. Lah. Okay, this is a list. Uh, change it how you like. The first is supposed to be uh, the question. The second would be uh, the answer. Yeah. So yeah, this is our gift to you. Yeah? Just change, play with it however you want. Yeah. Okay. Not not too much detail on this uh, because I think that's that's what's sufficient. Uh, okay. Next would be pandas. Okay. This we're just gonna be running through. Also, I'm gonna press play. And uh, what this does is that it's, it essentially goes to uh, Colab has got free uh, data for you. If you notice, it's got sample data, and you could use the uh, housing test data, train data, uh, MNIST, uh, however you want. Okay. So, what we've done here is that we've imported the CSV, which is a common separated value file, and then we have uh, manipulated the data, we've dropped everything that's less than fewer than 500 uh, on the population column, and then we've printed uh, the data set. Yeah, and this is an optional presentation. You say I want to comment this and I want to run play, and all I'll get is the basic uh, pandas data frame view. Uh, if I unblock this and run it again, you will get the, uh, the Google Colab data table view. Mm. Uh, okay, this I'll just press play. Again, it's taking, it's drawing data from this housing test thing. It's, it's going to drop anything fewer than 500 on the population column. And then it's going to import uh, Matplotlib, which we have imported as PLT. Uh, and with PLT comes the function scatter, title, and all this. If we were to, if we were to uh, put this in as they are, join them together and you press the PLT show, it should give you the, the graph. Just run it and that would show. 
uh, just breezing through because uh, uh, the kicker is actually at the towards the end. Uh, pillow, okay. Uh, this maybe is a little more interactive, guys. Uh, maybe this I want you to try uh, because it gives you a, a sense of what Colab is able to do. First, I would invite you to download small chunks. Uh, if you press here, you will see uh, small chunks. And how you download this is you press this over here. Okay, it should download a copy into your uh, whichever folder you choose. And then you should also download uh, the font if you want. You press download font, it should download uh, a font. Okay. And, and once you've done that, or once you've done that, you can, you can drag. Okay, you can drag. Okay, this is in content sample data. You can drag this, you can drop it. Okay, you can drag the file and you can drop it in your sample data to upload the file. And once you've done that for both small chunks and your free model TPM, press the play, it should pull, it should import the resources that you saved in your sample data and it's managed to take small chunks and make it a big chunks uh, and print out a, a text using the font file which you downloaded earlier. Mm. Yep, that's right. So these are just examples and uh, this notebook is for you to play with and experiment with. Uh, because I believe these five modules would be uh, quite sufficient for beginner's use. Uh, and just start small, you know, start with small projects. Uh, you might, uh, the next step would be maybe to change the input. Uh, it's all about reverse engineering, guys. Uh, learning Python, as far as uh, it was for me, is all about reverse engineering code. Yeah, just take it apart and change the variables. Okay, um, I think I think by now uh, all this um, all this talk about the modules and all we're not really getting to the uh, the, the gist of uh, what our session today really is about. And uh, let's let's check out the slides. You know. let's, let's talk a bit about data stuff. Yeah, talk a bit about data stuff. Uh, it's a big topic. I I I don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm not going to bore you with the facts about big data and uh, the deep stuff, you know, about big data. And, but, but, but what I'll give you is this, uh, the process of how, uh, uh, you know, analytics, you, know, you, hear, you hear of things like analytics, big data, uh, what is that all about? Uh, in summary, it is, uh, it's about getting the data and it's about cleaning the data. Later, you'll, you'll see what cleaning the data means. It's about transforming the data. Uh, also, something you'll see later, uh, it's about analyzing. We, we saw that, we saw that here with, um, yeah, with the scatter plot. We're analyzing in a way because we see where most of the concentrated, uh, you know, where, where the data is concentrated. And then we're able to make decisions based on it, uh, which is the final uh, uh, stage of the analytics process model. Um, in general, I would say, Selecting and scraping the data probably takes up 22% uh, 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 of the entire process. And it's not as glamorous as you think, yeah? Data, data scientists spend a lot of time uh, collecting data and cleaning data. It's uh, the machine learning and the, uh, the interesting bit comes after that. And that's probably like 10% or 20% of the entire stage. 80% is spent cleaning data, collecting data. Uh, if, if we have any uh, data science students who can vouch for that, give us a thumbs up. All right, so, so that's what it is, right? And today we're going to be doing regressions. Regressions uh, is about finding that R, R square value, that magic value that ties to uh, dependent, the dependent and the independent uh, variables together. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's about finding the magic value. And once you have that magic value, you could like uh, what, you know, you guys might have done already uh, or, or seen in practice uh, with the fields of economics, sociology, and statistics. Uh, it's all about finding that connection, how much uh, uh, the, the, the variables are, uh, how correlated they are, okay? And, um, and so here's how the, the graphs would look. Earlier we've seen the linear, the simple uh, linear regression model, and this would be a multiple uh, regression graph. And 
which is what we're going to be doing today, uh, except on a smaller scale. Okay, I'm not going to be doing something that's very, very complex. And uh, we just want to do a simple and a multiple uh, linear regression. Uh, all this talk about data, right? Uh, I would invite you guys to look up these uh, links. They are available in your uh, notebook. And, and then I'll, I'll just briefly explain what's going on here. Yeah. So if you were to go to this uh, bigtimeoil.com, uh, the, the MySpace for oil tycoons, um, you see here there is a there's table. This is data, guys. Okay, Data is the new oil. Uh, and we're going to try to extract this. So if I were to copy and uh, maybe if I were to go to my uh, spreadsheet, okay, Excel, huh? and paste this. Yep, I can do that. But say if I were to do it continuously, huh? uh, do it continuously like day and night, and I have to uh, look up this and it changes year on year, I would have to do the same process. Okay? Maybe for one commodity, you wouldn't feel the pinch, but but if it becomes like a routine thing, uh, you kind of want to automate it, right? And so this is what I meant by repetitive processes, something you can do away with, right? Like, uh, like this, we've got also a table here. Sometimes it's not always in the fixed position, not in the same position, so sometimes you're gonna know where to look. Uh, is this on the left, is this on the right? Um, and if you, are, if you are the Gordon Ramsay of data, you also have to be the bare grills of data. You have, to, you have to search for data. You have to, you have to clean your data. Yeah, A lot of it is about sanitizing the data, which we'll get to eventually. First, I would like to introduce to you a concept on what scraping is. Guys, scraping is go, it's like what we did. We're going to these sites. We're going there, and then we're going to our spreadsheets, and then we're pasting data, uh, collecting data, basically. That's what scraping is. But uh, there is a way to do it Pythonically, and we're doing it with a combination of beautiful soup. Okay, guys, you know this beautiful soup uh, request. Uh, and that's about it. That's for your scraping needs. And beautiful soup, I have no idea why it's called beautiful soup. Uh, maybe if you visit the official documentation, it'll give you some insight. Hi, yes, Grace. Uh, Grace, you got anything to say? Okay. Uh, a lot of accidental unmutes today, uh, not to worry. And uh, where will be? Uh, okay, beautiful soup. Okay, this is uh, one of the modules that we use for scraping. And then if you the press play, uh, I'll take you through the steps. It's gonna import. It's gonna import the models, the, the modules, and then it's gonna go to this uh, uh, Bitly site, okay, which was our first big time oil.com. It's gonna create. Uh, what is known as a soup, a soup. Uh, I'm not able to explain it, but uh, just think of it as a soup. Uh. Soup is like a package, and then from that package, what you do is that you will you will see in source. Uh, okay, let's visit the source for a bit. Visit the page source. Okay. Uh, if I zero in on maybe average, okay, average. I look at average. It is a header. Okay, it is a th, and then. The uh, the individual items will be TB, 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 TB. Uh, that's what it looks like in HTML. So if, if instead I didn't have, say I didn't have Excel, I copied this whole thing, right? Uh, and I, I pasted it in my collab. Okay, I pasted it in my collab. Like that. Okay, paste it in my collab. And then if I were to manually, Oh, it's gonna kill me right? if I if I if I just do this manually for all the few hundred items there are. Uh, so that's why we have this uh, RE regular expression. Uh, again, this is something you can look up in your free time. Uh, it it allows me to substitute, okay, to extract whatever that's between the uh, uh, the symbols. Kind of forgot what that symbol was. And it takes those items up, okay? Those items being the data that we're looking for, which is the, the value data, angled brackets. Thanks, Ethan. Okay. Uh, and then next we have this uh, data frame, which uh, takes all of this data that we've scraped from uh, the first site, and it's placed them neatly in this data frame, which we will later 
which will later uh, manipulate. Okay. The same process happens for this second uh, site, uh, the second site which you saw. Okay. Uh, and then there's the issue of sanitizing the data. As you can see, there are like dollar signs, percentages. Uh, and this, by the way, if you were to scrape, would start out life as a text uh, string. So if you were to do any calculations, it wouldn't yield any uh, meaningful results. Uh, so therefore, you have to do some bit of cleaning. And that cleaning is to remove the, uh, the dollar sign, again, using regular expression. And then uh, once you remove the, the dollar signs, we'll see that it's clean uh, without the dollar signs. Next, you would have to also, my apologies, you'll have to convert it to float. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between an integer and a float? Earlier, we've seen what an integer is. If you were to key in a, a string, you put a string, it's not automatically an integer unless you make it an integer. Uh, and a good example of an integer would be something without decimal points. And to have something that shows as 56.99, while having Python interpret that as 56.99, you'll have to convert it to a float. Okay, this uh, syntax is a little different compared to the usual float. Uh, uh, we could explore that in the Q&A. So what it does is that, what it did was that it converted the whole thing into uh, data which Python can work with. And then we went to plot, and then we were off to plotting already. Yeah, plotting and uh, creating that line of best fit. And here's something that uh, after all our hard work, here is the 10%. Okay, the 10% is that we can predict the price of gold when oil is 56.99, or you could change it to whatever uh, value. Say maybe oil is 19.35, and then I ran uh, the model. You would say, okay, gold is most likely 371 when oil is 19. So that, uh, my friends, is, uh, is a good example of how you can create a model. So that's a simple linear regression uh, model. Yeah, you've got you've got the chart, you've got the line of best fit, and then you've got the magic number. Yeah, the magic number, and the magic number allows you to predict uh, the dependent variable based on the value of the independent variable, which is this nineteen point three five. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll I'll do this one real quick. Uh, dollars. If you were to click the third link, the third link could be this. Uh, Third link, yeah, third link, third link, yeah, this one. So you go to the third link. Third link is for dollars, yeah. We've got oil, we've got gold, and now we're looking at the dollar index. Uh, it's got all of this, and it's not even in years for that matter. It's in it's in months, yeah. So that's that's one of the uh, occasional hassles that if you a data scientist uh, has in uh, you know your day to day. Uh, role is that you have to sort out these uh, 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 issues there. Yeah? You have to convert these months to years, which we've done so using the uh, the coerce, okay, the coerce method and the PD, uh, so we're using the date to time method. And uh, for errors, we have decided to coerce, uh, which is, I think, uh, it's, an, it's an exception that handling uh, uh, syntax. And then you convert, you have to specify uh, a format for it. This format, which we presented, is a day, month, and year. Okay, you let it know it's there's a day, month, and year, and then you convert it to a year. Okay, so that's when uh, you take in something like that, and then if you press play. Okay. So what we've gotten here is that it has scraped uh, all of the values. It's printed uh, only the headers, sorry. Uh, and then we have got the F3. So see if we were to just display the F3. Again, this uh, goes to show the runtime, yeah, runtime. Runtime uh, difference, yeah? if you were to use Python and see, we have uh, managed to clean up the data. It used to be in months, and there used to be so many of them. And then we have uh, run them through a mean formula, okay, which does for all the months. 
adds them up, divides by 12. Uh, and then next, we have to merge, like eventually, right? It's a multiple linear regression model. We've got oil, we've got gold, and then we've got the, the dollar index. And then we merge them together to form this big data. Okay, this is the merging function. You merge by year. Uh, that's why you should get it to be standardized. Uh, earlier, I, I forgot to mention that uh, if you were to look at this, it starts at 87, ends at 21. But uh, in, in our code, we have already filtered it to be uh, 87 to 2019. Yeah, because that applies to uh, the years which we have across the board. This is the 21. Uh, I think for uh, this next, we would only have until 19. So it has to be uh, standardized. Huh? and in order for you to create a chart like this. Okay, and, and this last segment, I promise you it's gonna be a real short one. You press play, it's gonna be the same as before. Uh, now that uh, we have got multiple regressions, we will be including two uh, independent variables and one dependent variable. And so for the independent variables, we will have to specify the, uh, the, the values, okay? There's, there's an easier way of doing this, right? You could do the, you could do it through input. Okay, you could do it through input where I'll just ex uh, demonstrate. A, B, C, A, B, C equals input. Yeah, and then float, I guess. We press play, and then we were to fifty-six point ninety-nine. Press the play, and then it gives us this, right? There's another way of doing it. I'm going to skip the visualization part because it's just printing your data, uh, your two-dimensional data, uh, which we had for a simple linear regression. Now it's a three-dimensional uh, data because we've got multiple uh, variables. You could actually create a, a, a GUI. It's, it, it's relatively unknown, this function, because many people say like, collect, you can't do GUI, it's true. Uh, but you have this uh, amazing thing. So with the sliders, you can play around, say price of gold, I set to 74.5, and then price of gold, maybe a thousand, and I press play. And then it's able to give me this output of, yes, your price of oil is 74.5, your price of gold is a thousand. Then the dollar index should be mm, 91.17, okay? Uh, I, I guess that concludes uh, uh, our, uh, our chapter on, on, on data stuff. I, 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 you know, it's, I'm sorry if it, it's a little too fast, but uh, uh, we've got plenty of time in Q&A to take your questions. Uh, the next bit, of course, is after you're done with this, watching, present, Back to the slides. Progress. After that. After that. And yep. After that. So we did. We did sanitize the data. We did run the the model. Uh, but there are better ways of running it. Okay, you could use Flask. You could use Django. But uh, that's a little too complex for today's workshop. We'll give it a miss. Uh, other places where you can get data. Uh, you could try out these two sites. If you want, you could screenshot. Uh, you've got Google datasets, rich material. Kaggle, a lot of uh, uh, user-contributed data. Also good stuff. And uh, open source, lah, open source, open source. So you can use it for your machine learning projects and uh, you can test it out. Mm -hmm. uh, using uh, the models. Excuse me. Yes, hi. Why is the line four of the GUI not working? Line four for GUI. Okay, okay. I'm just gonna take this really, uh, uh, really quickly. Line four, the GUI not working. Okay, line four. Are you seeing this line? This line right here. Ah, okay, good. Uh, okay. The reason is because you have to run. You have to run all. Uh, sorry, forgot to mention this. You have to run all uh, uh, the the code blocks associated with this. That means you'll have to go to the beginning uh, here, okay, scrape the data, and then you run to the next code block, uh, scrape the other data, uh, scrape that one as well. Uh, sorry, combine, sanitize, and then combine, okay? I guess it works in, it works in stages. You wouldn't be able to get to this stage without running all the, uh, the previous code before it. So I would, uh, I would highly encourage uh, for you to try it out on the press play for each of the stages. And then that's only when you're able to derive this magic number 
uh, and, and this magic uh, prediction, predictive model that allows you to uh, estimate the price of uh, the price of the dollar, I mean, the dollar index uh, based on the price of oil and gold. I hope that solves the question. You just gotta run through uh, all of it. Okay, uh, that's as expressed as an answer as I can give. Uh, but we're happy to discuss more uh, later on. To our other platforms, there is Slido, uh, Facebook, and if you guys uh, missed us, you could, you could try Stack Overflow. Um, all right, uh, guys, uh, that's enough from me. Uh, I will leave the remaining session to our uh, speaker, our next speaker, uh, Ethan. Uh, yes. Ethan, yes, hi, how are you, man? Hey, is my audio all right? Yes, fantastic. All Ready right, for excellent. some deep learning? Yeah, yeah. I okay, yeah, tell us. for uh, giving that uh, nice introduction to machine learning. I really liked where you ended off with linear regression because it leads perfectly into my next topic. Um, all right, awesome. Uh, I guess I'll take over from here. Thank you, Shongyang. Yeah, all right, tell us Great a bit fun. about yourself, man. Yeah, sure. So um, I've graduated with a master's in computer science last year. And since then, you know, I've been working. I've also worked a bit before um, during my master's or a few internships here and there doing my bachelor's. Um, and most of them have actually revolved around deep learning and their applications. I've done a little bit of research uh, in Microsoft Beijing. I've done some part-time work uh, building machine learning pipelines. Like, I mean, machine learning to automate pipelines. We'll get more into that later, like actual gas compression pipelines. So you could say I have a bit of machine learning experience in the field. And I'm just here to really provide an inspirational lecture, not so much a hands-on following because that, that would actually take hours and hours to go through all the required uh, prerequisites. But I'm just gonna give you a little inspiration, talk about a little bit of some of my experiences while doing mach uh, machine learning, why I like it, um, what I don't like about it. And yeah, we'll see. So let's get straight into it. So what is a neural network? Like everyone's always like neural networks this, neural networks that. Now, um, thanks to Chong Yang, uh, he's actually primed me up perfectly for when, um, when you remember when he was talking about multi-variable linear regression, where um, let's say you have a bunch of inputs and you want to predict an output, right? All it's doing is it's finding those magic numbers, as Shongyang would call it. These are called the weights, the optimal weights to produce a line such that it um, reduces the distance from all of the points, right? To find the general line of best fit. It's trying to estimate that. It's essentially what linear regression tries to do. Now, if you can imagine, if you look at the neural network on the screen, every circle to be a linear regression unit and all it does is it passes its output into the, into the next layer of the neural network. And so uh, through this process, you, know, you could add as many layers as you want. Here it only shows two hidden layers, but actually when you stack them and you actually like map them to each other and crisscross everything, not only do you have to find like, okay, so for Shongyang's three variable example, there are three magic numbers to find. Yeah, that's easy. But what about a parameter with 660,000 parameters to find? That's why like, I have to search through every single day, like 660,000 different possible numbers, which combination of numbers will produce the output that I want. And that's essentially um, neural networks in a nutshell. Those hidden layers, they're called hidden because we actually have no idea what they're doing. All it does is, is it's got so many variables of like multiplying and adding, multiplying and adding and like thresholding up and down that we have no idea what it's doing. But because we feed in the right data, because we, who are able to uh, give it a label to find out like, okay, if, how, how correct it was or how incorrect it was. We actually have a way to tune these weights uh, or magic numbers closer and closer such that then expected input would give it an expected output. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So um, there are many different types of neural networks. Uh, the one on the most left here, it's a recurrent neural, neural network. So it takes some of its input from the from a previous time step and feeds it back into itself. So now it's got some concept of let's say memory. So this is really helpful in tasks that have like that are temporal that go through time. Let's say identifying a sound or self-driving car. It's like you've heard self-driving car, right? You will want to remember what happened one second ago. So those that's the a basic overview of recurrent neural networks. Uh, feed forward neural networks are quite simple. Oh um, yeah, thank you. Um, they're, they're what I explained before, the, the bog standard, you know, uh, input in, multiply, multiply, multiply out, and that's it. 
it takes in numbers and it produces numbers. And here on the right, we have um, a cat dog classifier. Now this is actually what, um, you see how the layers are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, we call that a convolution neural network. Well, that's not exactly correct for anyone out there who's touched CNNs before, but um, the, the gist of it is by reducing the number of layers at each step, it forces the model to learn new things every layer. So like as, as the data progresses through, it has to get more and more coherent as it reaches the end, because at the end, it should be correct if you've trained it right. Okay, next step. Okay, um, actor critic reinforcement learning. Um, now this, I'll try to go slow and please do feel free to post some questions in the chat that I'll be getting to. But in essence, uh, let me tell you a little bit about when I used actor critic. Now, um, actor critic is mainly used for reinforcement learning tasks, which are usually used for active control. So like self-driving cars, if, you're, if you have an environment and every second, let's say you get Piece, new pieces of information about the environment. Let's say, oh, we just passed by a tree or, oh, like there's, a, there's another car coming up over the horizon. Like, what do we do? What do we do in this time step, the next time step? Let's say the first time step, okay, we apply a little bit of brakes. Second time step, okay, that's enough brakes. Let's let go. Like, how do we get a neural network to, to control it live and to do it in such a way that's safe? Well, um, while I was doing my master's, I was working at this company called Atmos International. And they do like gas pipeline leak detection, theft detection, and stuff like that. They're working on a new experimental project. Uh, I can't reveal the name, but uh, their <clears throat> goal is to control a gas pipeline using only AI. Because currently how it's done is there are like operators at each station along the gas pipeline. And these stations would contain compressors. The compressors can either be ramped up or ramped down. And the operators would sit there in coordination, look at the number of gas orders coming in from like a specific location or like outputs at other locations. Say like, okay, how much gas do we need today? It's gas planning essentially. And so my, the reinforcement learning agent that I trade had to use actor critic model for the very reason that, you know, you, you don't just act without thinking, do you? Like in the actor critic model, when you train a model, you're not just training a neural network, you're training two neural networks. The first one actually carries out the action. But the second neural network is trained to tell the actor how well it did, essentially. Because all the actor sees is just a bunch of states of pipeline. Let's say like, okay, the pressure at this point is this, the pressure at that point is this. It has no idea like what, what the best action to take is. So that's why we train a separate model called the critic to evaluate the actor's actions and then give it feedback so that the actor's actions get better and better over time. And we do this because it is very difficult to define one single formula that will determine how good the pipeline is doing at the current time. That's what we call a reward function. And so in this case, the reward function is non-differentiable because we're like, okay, if it exceeds this pressure, let's punish it a little bit. If it stays in the middle for a few seconds of time, let's give it more reward. If it doesn't turn off and on sporadically, you know, to save like maintenance fees, we give it more reward. So, that, so it's, it's very difficult to conceptualize that into just straight linear algebra. That's why we use a neural network to do it. Yeah, so um, I, any questions about actor critic? <laughs> um, it's, in essence, it's just two neural networks working together, each trained to do their specific task to accomplish one goal. Hey, Ethan, try to, oh, that was dark on me. Okay, I'll try to speed up. Sure, uh, 15 minutes left. Okay, we can go next slide. Autoencoders, right. So um, autoencoders are really cool because if you could see the neural network shapes a little bent uh, in, in some, in, into the middle. So the input on the left, it, it has to essentially, in order for it to be trained, it has to take the input on the left, compress it down into some sort of smaller dimensional representation. So there's less information there. So it has to like get rid of some noise somehow. It has to be able to be uh, an efficient compressor, but also an efficient decompressor. So, um, so how, how do you train such a thing that is able to compress something by, by just a standard neural network training? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, and auto caters are used in products such as NVIDIA DLSS. You know, when you have low res textures and they're automatically upscaled by our graphics card on the fly. Uh, photo colorizers. Like if you've got an old photo from the 1930s that you need colorizing, autoencoders can do that too. Uh, anomaly detectors, like on like pacemakers, or whatever, if they suddenly detect anomaly, they're like, okay, I need to send out a message to their loved ones or something like that. Uh, 
and also um, headless autoencoders, which we'll touch on, uh, generate stuff like uh, fake images or deep fake or generative art and stuff like that. Okay, uh, moving on. Now you guys get to find out how autoencoders really work. So texture upscaling, as I was talking about before, you know, how, how can we use autoencoders to automatically on the fly uh, upscale textures for a game while, while games running? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in the training stage, you know, we feed the, the low res image on the left um, and then we the corresponding high res image on the right. And as you can see, the network will try to learn to convert from left to right. So actually, um, the by doing by by compressing it down into a low dimensionality, the model essentially extracts features from what is the essence of what makes that cobblestone look like a cobblestone. What makes that that uh, brick block look like a brick block? It extracts some sort of like more abstract uh, idea of it and is able to reconstruct it from that abstract representation as well. So it's two halves, encoding and decoding. That's why it's called an autoencoder, or sometimes they call it encoder-decoder networks. Uh, next slide, please. So after you train something like this, you know, you've got new real upscale textures. When, when the graphics card says like, hey, I need this texture, and the, the card will just go like, uh, let me just grab it real quick and process it, and boom, spit out a higher res texture. Yeah, in real time. And it, it doesn't decrease performance that much because most modern GPUs have these things called tensor cores, which are completely unused for except, except for machine learning. So uh, yeah, they're on dedicated cores. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I've got a question. Is encoding a data change the data itself or still the same, but making it smaller? The data is completely changed. The data is not recognizable by any human any longer. It is recognized by only that model and it will be, um, but it's still got a way to come back through the decoder stage to, um, to, to make sense to us, you know, to actually make it, uh, useful in any way instead of round numbers right so how what happens if we take the left side and make it equal to the right side we basically train an encoder to say like hey i want you to compress all these faces down but like uncompress it and make the same faces again like you know for for the model to be successfully trained uh, our criteria is it has to take take the face compress it and do it perfectly essentially so what happens if we train that for a long time next slide please it will eventually get really good at at doing nothing essentially, right? You would think so, like, hey, can you take this photo and reconstruct it into the exact same thing? But what if, like, here we are, we just chop off the encoder part. We just like slice it straight off and we, we just use the middle and the end sections. What happened next? So remember how I was telling you that the middle can just be like, it's, it's just an arbitrary representation. It's just, a, it's just an array of numbers. It's maybe like of size, like 30, 50, 80,000 different numbers, but there's still just an array of numbers. So next slide, please. So what happens if you take those 30, 80,000 numbers, you just give them random variables, boom, boom, like uh, put a one here, put a zero here, whatever. Like what it'll do is it'll generate completely new faces. Faces that I've never seen before, like they're not real. They're just literally a configuration of the compressed way that the neural network has learned to see those faces to begin with. And that's why it's, it's actually, it's very interesting to me because at first glance, it would look like it's a completely useless network until you get a little creative and you're like, oh, you chop it off and just throw some white noise into the input. That's when you, that's how things like, um, there's some music generators. If you guys want to go on artbreeder.com, that's where you can breed like art pieces together, like Pokemon <laughs> come up with little children. So yeah, my, my point is like uh, neural networks is all about creativity. Of course, the strong fundamentals of math won't hurt. In fact, it's actually quite, uh, I use it quite often in my job. Like when, when my model's not training, I'm like, oh, what, what do I do? I have to go back to the basics, think about my calculus, say like, okay, maybe it can't find the gradient in this dimension or that dimension. And it's just like the, the, the process, the data pipeline process that Shongyang showed from like cleaning the data, processing it, then extracting it, building your model. Uh, I just have to do that over and over and over again until I come up with a satisfactory model. No, I mean like, it, it takes a lot of creativity, you know, like with the actor critic model, with the autoencoders, you can see it's kind of like Legos. That's how I think of neural networks, just functional components working together to accomplish one goal. Oh, quick question. Hello, do we need to understand the ethics of uses of these softwares? Um, that's down to the moral individual, I guess. 
because I believe in free and open source software. In fact, a lot of the library Shongyang was using before, like uh, Beautiful Soup is completely free and open source. It's um, developers like me and like every other, like a lot of developers that are working take some of their spare time to give back to the community. You know, we wouldn't have such easy code uh, like just import Beautiful Soup, give it a website if it weren't for the developers behind it. So also you can go leave them their thank yous or whatever, but I like to give back to the open source community. Yeah, so ethics uh, up, up to the individual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks for your quick question, Dixon. Uh, playing with GANs, yeah, so here we are. So um, it's essentially like GANs isn't quite the term for a headless autoencoder, but you could call it that. Uh, GANs are generative adversarial networks where they have multiple neural networks like competing against each other in order to drive up each other's accuracy in a, in a zero sum game such that the whole system as a whole trends towards being better at what it's trained for. <laughs> yeah, uh, this person does not exist.com. It's pretty cool. It generates an infinite amount of random bases, like not random, but like bases that don't exist of people that don't exist. Uh, our breeder and yeah. Um, oh yeah, and video research Gaogan is pretty cool. It, I think it's the one where you can draw on it and it will complete your artwork, but I'm not too sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, want, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about the company I'm currently working for. So it's Regop Technologies. They're a local Malaysian company uh, founded uh, about three years ago, still pretty small, under 50 employees. But the reason why I chose to work there instead of the big companies like Asiata or Microsoft is because I'm right in there, right in there every day with my boss. Like I'm shadowing him. Like my boss is the vice president. I get to see how business operations is conducted and how that filters down to the software level. So I like to get a full view of like the whole stack of not only computer processes, but managerial processes, people processes, sales acquisition, everything. Uh, anyways, the reason why I'm telling you is, please next slide. Uh, we do like lots of AI, blockchain, uh, our main focus like chatbots or general AI, custom AI solutions. If any of you guys are interested, we are taking blockchain graduate trainees. So if any of you guys are close to graduating or even want a summer internship, uh, like the required, the bar is quite low, you know, like you just come in, like we may or may not pay you depending on your skill level, but it's really good experience. And like, I could seriously vouch for that. And, you know, if, if you come in, you might, me, might even be able, be able to work with me. So, yeah, uh, I think the, the presentation will be sent around later or the recording. So feel free to visit us at regovtech.com or just reach out to me directly. Yeah, here, regovtech.com slash careers. And uh, we can have a little chat and maybe we'll find a place to put you. Okay, so that's all from the talk side of my things. I think maybe Shongyang and other committee members can come back and we can have a, do a little Q&A. Yeah. Hey, just wondering, is this your specialization covered during your master's study? And if so, what master's program do you think you'd recommend someone looking to get into the field of AI and data science coming from a CS degree? Okay, so like my, my bachelor and my master's were just gen generic computer science. Most of my experience comes from work. It's, it comes from getting internships. It comes from working on open source projects. Like there are th like th hundreds of thousands of developers your age with similar wor working experience that could like, you know, band, band together and form projects. So if I were to get into machine learning, I would start with Kaggle, as Sean Yang said. Lots of nice data sets to play with. Lots of like creative ways you can think of how can I apply data? How can I apply a model to data? To produce a solution. That's basically the three-step process I usually go through generally. Like, what, what kind of data I need? What I need? Um, how do I process it? How do I make it useful? That kind of stuff. So definitely projects first, and um, studies aren't so as important as you might think while you're in university. <laughs> That's what I would say. But definitely still just try to get the best mark you can. Fundamentals are all very important. Math. Better enjoy math if you want to go into machine learning. Machine learning. But as a data scientist, I would say more statistics. Okay. What are the respect to all computer science students beginning to now? I really want, I really understand nothing. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, um, it does sound a very daunting when you first get into it. But, you know, I've been doing this since my A levels. So I've had quite a few years to, to get, get into it. And like, it always feels like you're drowning. I still feel like an imposter. Like, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just Googling everything all the time, but that's part of the job. The part, part of the job is for you to learn things quickly, not for you to know everything. Yeah, good question. What are the modules? 
um, like the modules of my Maybe university Shongyang? course. Maybe Shongyang can oh. say about this. Oh, that's from four. Okay, cool. Shongyang? Okay, well, module, I wouldn't refer to the dictionary uh, uh, definition of module, but although I would say that's very close, it is, um, it is a library, basically, think of it. And, and, and Python has about 137,000 libraries, like as mentioned before. So these libraries in it, they've got uh, many tools. So think of modules as like the Swiss Army knife. Hmm. That's, Actually, uh, that's the better way to put it is modules is code someone else wrote that they'll, they're like, okay, just use it. Use it for free for the betterment of humanity. That, that's what the Open Source Foundation believes anyways. That's why all this code is all free. Every, that's why programming resources are basically free. Basically, I built my career of machine learning not off my, um, my university course or anything. Maybe a little bit of fundamentals there, but mostly through self-study. All the papers are free. Okay, first, <laughs> good job. <laughs> Is it possible down? Okay, no, uh, yeah, we've already answered that. Is it okay use MacBook for coding or better get desktop? Doesn't matter. We're using Google Colab nowadays. I train everything in the cloud. I can use my phone to work if I wanted to. Is Muzamil single? All right, let's let's uh let's ask Muzamil. Start working through these questions. Is there an IDE that works best for Python? I either recommend PyCharm, VS Code, or just use Google Colab. Uh, I saw a question just now about uh pertaining to a and a career AI, a career in AI. Oh, some real life examples for regression. I don't know if this is in the slides or not, but I came up with this during brainstorming. Uh, you can try to predict the number of houses around you based on how many mamak stalls are in a 30 kilometer radius or a three kilometer radius, sorry. You just go look at Google Maps, you count the number of mamak stalls, you count the number of houses around it, you create your data set, you've got your dependent variable and your independent variable. Then you just throw into linear regression and then you've got a model to predict here. Yeah. Uh, one, yeah, that's the one. If I want to do AI, but in robotics, do we need to do codes like what we learned today too? Yes, and a lot more. Like what Shongyang went through is basically like uh, AI 101, let's say. But beyond that, there's so much research coming out year after year after year. It's hard to keep up. Like if you're, if you're not always like trying to keep up, you just slowly start falling behind. But it's not that bad. But you just got to try to catch up to your time, I guess. Just, just keep learning. That's all I can say. Keep learning. Uh, why is Ethan so hot? Thank you. Thank you. Is CS and IT the same thing? No. Um, generally, how I've heard the terms referred to is IT is more like how to use computers or how to fix computers. But CS is more like the theory behind how computers work or how to produce good software and et cetera. Uh, do you recommend any open source data science, data analytics software and tools? Yes. Um, of course, matplotlib. It's, it's very widely used in my job as well. Uh, Keras and TensorFlow, those would probably be, and SciPy would be very easy entries into the machine learning slash data science space. Uh, yeah, uh, just look on Kaggle, look on Stack Overflow, uh, read lots of Stack Overflow. Like that's more than 50% of my job. Uh, appreciate everyone who's contributed to the workshop today. Yeah, thanks everyone. It went very well. It, it, it seems like the audience has plenty of questions and we're running out of time. Please feel free to stop us if we're going over, but I can continue answering questions. You have to be really good at math to study data science, computer science. Ah, I wasn't that great at math. I'm, my, my degree is like an engineering degree. I think more like an engineer than a mathematician. I think of how to solve problems. I see like, okay, if this doesn't work, is there like another drop-in module I could replace it with? So that's my approach to machine learning and data science, um, more from like an engineering perspective. Like, I don't, I don't know if that means anything to you, um, you guys, because in my university, they had a distinction between the engineering and the science course. And one was more studying like research, one was more studying like applications and deployment. And I went more down the deployments um, route because I don't know, I like, I like seeing things happen in front of me. Good question. Can companies stop asking us to do two plus people work for minimum wage pay? Hey man, like when you're first starting out, uh, all experience is good experience, even when it's free. Like it's actually like takes time out of someone who's venturing you's day, which is already like super packed. So if you could take the free internship, man, take the free internship for sure. That's advice that like my, my first two internships were free. Like, and that was before university, even during university, I took some free internships, free projects, help a friend out. All experience is good experience. Hey, do we need to do anything for the certificate? 
Uh, I'm not sure too sure about that. Maybe Justin, you want to hop in? Yeah, so only for pre-university students, in some way, we'll get a certificate. So we will be emailing you the certificate. You don't have to do anything. But for degree students, we won't be providing any certificate. Yeah. And okay. I think Anonymous says, may I know where we could learn, self-learn more about Python? So like, if you guys want to learn about, more about Python, you guys can just carry on what Chongyang was doing. Just search linear regression Python on Google. And then you just click on any link that has code and explanation, which is probably going to be all 10 of the first 10 results. And you just follow the tutorial. Open a Google Colab notebook nice and fresh and just try to follow along. YouTube also. You just go on YouTube, search machine learning introduction for Python. There are so many tutorials, so many excellent instructors out there, all completely for free, all completely doing it because of their passion for the subject. Uh, if one is dead set on being a data scientist and has no interest in software development, should he, she say, do a master's in data scientist to specialize ASAP? It's a very difficult question. Depends on data science degree from where. Because if your stack is outdated in that data science university that you want to go to, then it's actually no point. You're not going to learn anything that you're going to use in real life. But if you really want to be a data scientist, I'd say try get a data science internship before you switch off the generic computer science or software development branch. Because there is so much that I learned from software engineering and all those other modules that have nothing to do with AI that really do contribute to my thriving of like producing models, uh, not producing like coding, but like producing results with models, with teams, like coordinating with like product owners and marketing and everything. Yep. Uh, is programming required in natural sciences? If you want to analyze the data of your own experiments, then yes, definitely. But otherwise, uh, if you just want to design experiments. I, I think data science is still kind of important, but then I don't know what you mean by uh, a scientist or natural sciences. Okay, so okay. We'll, we'll take three to five more questions Sam, because I think we are running out of time. All right, all right, all right. All right, uh, our AI courses are on the same as computer science courses in uni. Um, yeah, basically AI might focus on more maths than statistics. Depends on what you like. Really just try to get through uni and have fun during uni. That's uh, one, one big thing that you guys should do. Because when, once you're grown up, no more summer holidays, guys. Oh, this is my first year without a summer holiday. <laughs> OK, if I want to start learning machine learning neural networks, where is a good place to start? Uh, right. I answered before. Just Google machine learning Python on YouTube. Plenty of resources for the motivated learner in 2021. Question for me. I've seen your open source project like Hornstat. Is the programming on the project using deep learning or no? <laughs> Very good question. Uh, we don't use deep learning per se, but we've got data science involved, like, you know, um, concatenating rows, making graphs, making like time, uh, time series data accessible to members of our project. But also machine learning will come soon. I just haven't had the time. Okay, is Benjamin single? How does data science differ with bioinformatics? Uh, bioinformatics is data science for the genome. It's what I learned in my university course essentially. Linux or Windows for coders? I don't have Windows installed anymore. I even do all my gaming on Linux. Um, I would definitely recommend Linux because it would really teach you how to deploy things on the cloud, which, you know, by the looks of things, everything will be on the cloud. So it will be a great head start if you guys start using a little bit of Linux and dip your feet in a little bit. Uh, how do I get internship jobs while studying when my SEM breaks are only three to four weeks? Um, take up projects with your friends. That's just as valuable. Piece of advice would you give to a student that's getting into computer science at university level with no experience of formal computer education? It's okay. I got into computer science with basically no formal education in computer science. Just code a little bit, have one or two projects. And as a fresh like entry to university, it, it, it's a really good candidate that has like at least one or two projects rather than most of them that have none. Uh, I think um, we'll start with first. So uh, okay. The photograph session first and the feedback session. And after that, if you we we'll still have time, we still can go back to the QA session. So sure. everybody, let's open your camera and let's have a group photo. <laughs> no, no, people are leaving now that everyone's oh, no. camera is open. Bye. I know. But yes. If if y'all still want and if everybody's still down for it, we can still have our QA session. Because yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's just uh get our picture first. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. It's the first time we filled up the front page. Yeah, <laughs> kind of empty the whole time. Let's try doing <laughs> two pages. All right. Oh, some people have DM'd me asking me for my contact. So I'm just going to post my github.io page. You guys can contact me there and um, it will send it to my email.
Oh, why is Wenyi showing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a lot more questions in the chat. <laughs> Okay, okay. Can I answer them while we're taking this picture? Yeah, you can talk while being <laughs> 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 uh, Yeah, of course. So um if, by the way, if everyone is ready, I will just say three to one and take it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think Ethan, you can continue with the questions later. Yeah, on. Okay. They said if study CS degree, can I get into AI data science field after? Yeah, definitely. I didn't have a shred of AI in my in the title of my degree, but like if you're interested it, and you just go seek out the information you want, you, you'll get there. Uh, so is it okay to use them? I won't be sued, right? I'm assuming you guys are talking about deep fakes. Uh, maybe you might get sued over intellectual property. The laws on deep fakes aren't. Three, two, uh, okay, three, two, five. one, smile. <laughs> <My turn. laughs> Is stats or pure math component more important? I've heard someone saying we need to be good at calculus in some YouTube video. Yeah, you have to be decent at calculus. You have to understand what calculus means. You don't have to be good at calculus. I'm really bad at calculus. But you have to understand what it means in terms of vector space uh, because that's all neural networks is. It's calculus over uh, multi-dimensional vector space, maybe like, you know, like the axis of like X and Y. Imagine if you added Z and then you added like C and then O and all of them are completely separate axes. Yeah, you have to do calculus in a space like that, not a three-dimensional or two-dimensional space, but a space with thousands of dimensions. So understanding what calculus is, is very important. You actually using it, I don't use it as much as I thought I would be, for sure. Okay, okay. Um, let's go to the feedback session first, and later we'll come mm, sure. to the Q&A session. So hold on, let me share my screen first. Okay, Muzamil, we can take over. Yeah, well, so we really hope you all learned something new today. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of new stuff to absorb. It would be awesome if, if all the participants, yeah, if you guys have any feedback for us, please do drop us by scanning the QR code. Yeah, so we can improve for our future events. Yeah, so take some time, guys, to scan. If you have any, like, you know, things to say about it, the workshop and yeah the the link is in the chat as well for you to fill up your feedback form yep so to those who can't scan you guys can check it out yeah i think we can go to the next slide yeah so uh also make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And yeah, in, in Instagram is where we post a lot. So you'll be notified for your- Will you guys be posting your... the session on YouTube? Sorry, it will be quite good. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, cool. yeah, we will. Thank we you. Will. So yeah, so to be notified of our future events, you can just follow us on Instagram. And we'll be also having a CL CNS event on our 17th of October, 17th September. of September, it's my bad. So those who want to join, just, I think, Benjamin will send the link. Yeah, the link will be in the chat box. So you guys can sign that, sign up there. Yeah, and I think to add to this, for anybody who's interested in joining as a member for STC, um, you can just like inquire and ask us on any of our social medias and we'll get in touch with you there. And yeah, like what Muzamil said. So next week, for those of you who are Sunway students, Student Life will be hosting a CNS CNF's Carnival info session and SEC session will be next Friday at 8 p.m. So yeah, um, for those of you interested to learn more about our club and learn more about what we're going to do and what's in it for you members, it's, um, yeah, do, do join us next weekend and then next Friday and uh, we'll be there to answer your questions. But yeah, that's about it for me. Okay, I think we can go back to the Q&A session because we still have so many questions I, and I yeah. think it is like yeah. very... I, I don't mind staying for them. more. I, I will have to go maybe in about 15-20 minutes max because I'm, I'm actually packing off uh, to go traveling. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, taking... Finally, I, I work um, with basically... I basically haven't taken any leave. So this is the first time I've taken leave in like 
months. I'm taking a whole week off. So <laughs> I'm going to be enjoying this. All right. So how does data science differ? Yeah, like I said before, it was just mainly on genes. Um, bioinformatics also talks about patient ethics, uh, maybe data protection, what data can, is ethical to use as training data. Like also the ethics of bioinformatics are really cool because I learned of this one case study in my master's course, bioinformatics, where, you know, if, if you're trying to come up with, uh, you have to have a representative data set, right? Let's say if you have um, a model that's trained on 1 million random people, just pick randomly from, from the world, then it would only represent that 1 million people. What if, let's say, 60% uh, of the world is Chinese, let's say, then there'll be an abundance of Chinese data in the data set such that the other minority groups won't be well-trained enough. And in bioinformatics, that's very important because it could mean the decision of life and death. If a machine learning model gives like a prescription that a doctor follows, who's responsible if, some, if something goes wrong? Who, 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 blood is on whose hands? Um, I think the law believes the blood is on the hands of the company that creates the machine learning model that does misdiagnosis. So bioinformatics is quite tricky. Uh, I'm, I'm not touching that with a 10 foot pole. Like, I just like uh, making, uh, making things that aren't so serious, I guess. I mean, Aren't, aren't so dire or grim or have such long lasting consequences. Yeah, that's a better way to put it. Uh, how? Okay, I, I think we answered the first three already. Oh, we've. What's the difference between data science and computer science degree? Yeah, it's more stats in a data science degree, I guess. The computer science is very important. If you ever want to deploy anything to a model, uh, to, to the cloud or You could always go into data science after, but as a data science degree, if, if you're, if you graduate with the data science degree, it's much harder to get into software engineering than the other way around, I would say. Mm. Is mathematics important in works? Yes, mathematics is very important, but um, only to a certain extent. Once like, like the first two years of me mach learning machine learning, it was literally just like math, 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 math. Like it was, it was really quite something. But after a little while, like after you start to build that foundation, you don't really have to think about it at that level anymore. You can think about it more on a higher level, like, okay, I need a convolutional network there. Okay, maybe like an LSTM after that would be good. Like layers of, think you, you can start moving up layers of abstraction. Um, it's what they call in computer science. Uh, do you have any good source recommendation to keep up the latest code updates in the industry? Yes, actually I'll type it into a chat right now. This is one that I use to keep up with machine learning, paperswithcode.com. Uh, maybe the papers might be like you, you'll be able to see what kind of math that you have to know if you want to implement new models, papers.code.com. But essentially, it just provides papers of machine learning and deep learning with code. So you can read the code, you can run the code yourself, you, know, you can play with the researchers' findings and whatever. Uh, do you have, does getting an RTX 3070 or 3080 really help though? For real, bro, if, if you want to get, get good at games, you got to get those frames. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have experience with cybersecurity? No, I, I did the module in university. Um, you know, like when everyone starts out computer science, they're like, yeah, I want to be a hacker. I want to be a hacker. But after doing it, like it's cool and all, it might've been a good second choice for me, but I found machine learning and I'm, I'm very happy here. Another good contender is quantum computing. Now that's probably for, for the generation below me, which is you guys. You know, if you guys have the chance to learn some quantum computing, I think quantum computing plus AI is going to change the world. Uh, I'm interested in game development. Is it good to go for computer science? Yes. Uh, I used to like also, oh yeah, game development is also another one that people really like doing computer science for. They're like, oh yeah, I want to be a game dev, let's do computer science. Yeah, um, I would recommend sticking to computer science and then going to game dev after. Uh, like game dev is a lot, uh, if, if you really like being challenged, if you really like puzzles, definitely go for computer science first. It molds your brain in a way that uh, just a game dev, like a course on learning how to use Unity, Unreal, how to do texture mapping, whatever. It will never teach you the, the logical, analytical, algorithmic thinking that something like software engineering or computer science gives you. Any tips for creating a startup? I don't know, man. You tell me. <laughs> if you got any good money-making ideas, shoot them my way. Like, no one knows how to make a successful startup. It, the landscape's always changing. You know, all, the only tip that I can give you is to be flexible, to keep your eyes open, to, to you know, 
to bend with the wind, as they say. <laughs> uh, will, do we really have to be interested in CS to continue on this path? Uh, depends on what you mean by CS. If you don't like networking, like, like computer networks, you don't like cybersecurity, you don't like algorithms, it's whatever. You can still be interested in AI. But for me personally, I wouldn't be able to know because I was interested in basically all the modules that were offered to me. Uh, what did you do for a final year project? Ah, very nice, very good question. If you go on my GitHub, you can look at generative music. That's what I did. I created a web browser application that will generate infinite amounts of music. Uh, there's no machine learning in it, but I thought it was cool. It, I just took, um, I play a lot of music. I like composing, like I'm a producer. It find me on Spotify. It's on my GitHub page. And uh, yeah, I, I just implemented my knowledge of music theory into a program. Press play. You guys can see the code. It's on GitHub. So that's why I love about open source. You guys want to find out how it works? Just read the code. If you don't know what something works, just Google it. That's all. Uh, what are the best social media platforms that skip on new technologies and events? I wouldn't know. If you have any idea, let me know. I'm in like discords, machine learning discords. I, I'm on some subreddits, some Facebook groups, like uh, programmer null posting, mostly the meme groups, right? Like that's, that's what you would be using social media for. And if I want to do actual networking, I'd be on LinkedIn. I'd be looking for people that have like the skill set that I might need for some project or that we might need as a company. We can like hire them as a contractor or whatever. It's not working. Hey, uh, do, does coding interviews reflect what we actually learned in uni? Depends on who you're in, who's interviewing you. Uh, for me, my coding interviews normally go like, I'm, I'm just talking through my thought process. Say like, oh, they, they tell you, oh, we have this many people in a hotel and we want to fill up every room. How do we map? map it correctly so now i'm like okay first i think of what data structure i can use best to represent this maybe a tree maybe like a stack a, a multi-dimensional stack a queue or whatever and then I, I just go at it i just talk through my thought process that's in the end that's what they want to hear they want to hear if you can break a problem down pick the right solution of uh, the right technologies for each and every component uh, con a com contributing component to the solution of your problem and then see if you can code it or not which is the least important part actually the 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 Breaking down steps, creating the solution is much more important than actually writing the code. Once you get a few years in, in the industry, can you create a new language? Yeah, anyone can create a new language. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah, you can, it's called the compilers module. Like some universities might offer it, and that's how you create languages uh, from ones and zeros to text uh, and back. I've seen Ethan play Brawlhalla on Linux. Yes, I've played Brawlhalla on Linux. I play many games on Linux. I do everything on Linux. It's great. If something doesn't work, I just tell myself, well, if I want it to work, I just better code it myself. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking to get into AI engineering. By, what do you mean by AI engineering? You mean like uh, data pipeline kind of stuff? Because that's what engineer um, implies. Unless you're talking about machine learning engineering, which is what I'm doing. Which is more like, you know, um, layers of the neural network rather than layers of a data pipeline. Data pipeline being like, okay, you've got like many sources here and there. How do you get it? into like your main database and how you clean it and then how do you automatically send it to your machine learning models that data pipeline stuff um how much math do we need to know as much uh, the, the more money you want to make the more math you got to learn kind of like if you want to get into like machine learning pure and like be a pure programmer if you want to be a like move into managerial or other aspects of computer science like entrepreneurship then maybe math isn't so important but if you're an actual like honest to God programmer, you don't want to sit down there and solve problems, especially in machine learning AI, the more math you know, the more cutting edge models you can understand and conceptualize, the more money you make. The company that employs you, the more money you make. <laughs> uh, how to get an internship, uh, apply everywhere, like 300, 400. If you don't hear a response, that's pretty normal. Like just spam click everywhere. There are so many people looking for internship. Try to have some project on your CV. Try to make it so like the first page on your CV looks pretty and neat and has most of the information on it. Because how it usually works is what I hear, like the, the, they have some really busy manager gets like a huge stack of CVs on their desk and they're like, okay, we need two new interns. They don't have time to sift through all that. Like most of it's going in the garbage on like after first glance. So you've got to really make your pop. It's got to be clean, simple, straight to the point with your skills. Uh, that's the only advice I can give you other than apply more. <laughs> Which project's the one you feel proudest of? Uh, to be honest, generative music. I've always wanted to become a rock star. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I can like finally code something to make music for me. I can listen to it. Like, that's probably, that's probably it. Other than that, like, I find the machine learning stuff I do quite fulfilling as well. Like, uh, 
like some of the custom models I trained, I don't think I can reveal much information about it, but it's basically like a self-coaching app where it tells you not to stutter or tells you not to repeat words, stuff like that, not to use filler words. All that's part of my machine learning. I'm pretty proud of that. It's very difficult to train. And at least my model is kind of doing something now, needs more training. I don't know. Uh, thank you everyone, especially to Ethan for making such a great and useful open source project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know how you heard of that project, but thank you. I'm glad that you enjoy using it. And thank you for all the other great speakers as well and the STC committee that actually really helped this project come together. We couldn't have done it without the STC committee. Honestly, all the praises should go to them. They just asked me to come in for a guest talk. I didn't prepare much. Like These guys prepared day and night for, for weeks for this. So good job, guys. Good job. Any job opportunities for AI slash data science here, or is it better to go abroad, China, US, ETC? I think it's scarce here. To be honest, right? Like I've applied quite a lot in the data science market of Malaysia, like companies like Asiata, companies like Shell, Petronas, like Hotlink, DG, Maxis, like all these huge companies with lots of data, there will be data science positions. Like I found quite a, quite a few while looking. Obviously, like you have to have a bit of experience first, right? You've got to pull yourself up from the bootstraps. How do you get experience with no experience? No one will hire you, right? You make a project, make a project and be able to talk about it for the length of a whole technical interview. You should, you should get the role. Software engineering or computer science degree, um, not much difference. Depends on what uni you're in, depends on what you want to do. Look at the modules that they offer each and pick your favorite ones. Uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> All right. Uh, any, I'm currently interesting, interested into AI engineering. Is there any advice on how you guys started? Yeah, like I said, start a project. Start a project where you can, like, like Strongly said, right? Like, you know, his website scraper, it collects data. Um, maybe you can automate it with a while loop and some sleeps, and then you can have a live pipe da dashboard of like oil prices versus gold prices versus whatever. Then you bring in the start bringing the data science models, the predictive modeling, linear regression, random forest, neural networks, anything. You just like have fun, do whatever with data. Data is very fun. If I want to do AI with the medical field. Do I still need biology? Uh, no, not really. I don't think so. I think if you try to get hired in the biomedical scene, they'll probably look at your merit as a computer scientist more than your merit as knowing knowledge about a doctor because a doctor is a specialist in what he does when projects like this come up like bioinformatic machine learning normally they pair researcher doctor and machine learning engineer team like quite a few of them as consultants because something so sensitive right so if you want to apply as a doctor go as a doctor if you want to apply as a computer scientist go as a computer scientist on a scale of one to ten how much do you stack up for working ten straight up ten like i Almost all my code's copied, literally. All I need to is like know where to look for it, how it fits into the rest of my code design, and then fix the bugs. All right, copy, paste, fix the bugs. And the it, it sounds very easy, but there's actually a skill to how to Google, how to Google in the shortest amount of time exactly what you need to find. And that comes with experience. Like I get faster in Google in the more programming I do. So don't be ashamed. It's all right. Everyone, everyone feels like they're an imposter too. No one feels like they can code. That's just the nature of the industry. The things moving so quickly. No one knows what they're doing. So neither, neither should you and neither should you care. As long as you think you're making progress and you're better than who you were yesterday every day. Well, not necessarily every day, but yeah. Uh, would it be better to learn in depth on algorithms or using inbuilt functions like linear regressions? Both are important. Depends on where you are in life. If you're doing your bachelor's degree, focus on algorithms. If you're just trying to dip your feet in the water, trying to garner some passion for the subject, definitely use um, inbuilt functions. Unless you really like the algorithms part, then you know, go for it. Ethan is such a good speaker. Thank you. Thank you. It's, all, it's a lot of experience. Um, but I was quite nervous before joining, not going to lie. Shongyang set a very high bar for me to meet. <laughs> Can you share to us the spec of your PC? Yeah, now I'm just using a laptop, but the one at home has a 1660 Super. Uh, I'm traveling at the moment, so. Haven't, haven't been back to my desktop for a while. What careers prospects for an IT graduate? Do they do coding as well? It depends if you find a coding internship or not. I have prospects, I don't like that word because the world is so open-ended. Like you get an IT degree, you could end up doing anything except for like being a doctor or a dentist, whatever, right? But like anything in coding. If you manage to meet the right people, have, have a nice boss, have a good relationship with the boss. And most importantly, you take the right initiatives. You see something that can be done. You say, hey, can I do it better? Can I learn it myself and implement it? That's why I learned in my current job, right? Like my boss, he's so busy, like worrying about clients, worrying about like getting new business. I just go around the company. I see like, hey, this is still manual work. Let's automate it. Hey, 
like like my boss like you you're actually spending three hours on the weekend doing this task every week bro let me automate that for you so it's all about being proactive like these opportunities they they don't come to me they, they i have to find them at least in a startup environment where everyone above you is just too busy to give you any attention you really have to just just do your own thing and that's what i love about um yeah, you know, you guys can probably tell I, I enjoy quite a bit of freedom and flexibility in my work-life balance. Uh, what's your Discord slash Reddit name, bro? Mr. Sussy Bussy. Uh, Reddit or Discord? Probably won't re reveal that. But people in this talk who already know my Discord, you guys know my Discord. <laughs> uh, I like both data science and biology. Should I get a CS degree, data science degree, or should I actually get a bioinformatics degree? I think if I were to rank them, I would... In your case, I would probably go first choice data science, second choice CS degree, third choice bioinformatics. Because the way I see things is like, the more broad, the better, because then you have much more opportunities. If you get hold into a bioinformatics degree and you don't find a job in bioinformatics, what are you gonna do? Like, especially with someone has no experience coming out of university with a bioinformatics degree, it, it's a much safer option to keep your options open, get a little bit of experience first. Then eventually, if you still want that bioinformatics job, like you'll slowly just work your way through life and eventually get to your bioinformatics job if that's still in your goals. Uh, can you send presentation slides? Yeah, uh, Jasin. Yep, okay, she says yes. Job requires three years experience to apply, but you talked about your past passion projects in the technical interview. Yeah, or like some of my, uh, sometimes I talk about my work experience and I talk about my passion projects. Depends on who's interviewing me. Like what, what kind of person do they seem like? They seem like someone who really wants to get down and dirty into the technical. Is it like just some manager that really just likes hearing and having a conversation and seeing, sussing you out to see if you're like a, a good person to work with? It depends. It really depends. So just really read the room and, and then you'll know what to focus on in the interview. Uh, how do I succeed given that internship slash job need experience? Well, I can't really get real job experience. Try doing my own project, but it's not enough. Uh, honestly, just apply more. I had to apply for like hundreds of jobs to get to where I am. Uh, just just mass apply. Don't be afraid to take no for an answer. And if you take, if you get too many rejections, maybe let's say you apply to 300, you've got through to 30 interview stages and you after, out of 30, you didn't manage to score even a single one. Then I think it's time to take a step back and work on yourself. Just do more project, more self-study. No, especially collaborative projects, right? Try to, try to find discords or Reddit communities where they've got like, hackathons or like find a team find a project you volunteer in this way how's life ethan life's pretty good life's pretty good uh is bachelor of science in cs the same as b engine cs no it's not the same depends on what university you go to you'll have to look at what the differences are for me bachelor's of science oh uh, no my, my was masters of engineering and my and uh bachelors of engineering and so what that meant is instead of a big because I did engineering instead of science, I had to do a internship or a industry placement. Whereas my friends over in the science course, they had to write a big report, like a dissertation for their masters. So that's the only difference that I knew for me. Otherwise everything was the same, but it varies, depends on your uni. Check out the modules that they, they offer for each. Uh, how do computer science differ from computer engineering? Computer engineering is more like low-level stuff. Like not low-level in a bad way, but like low-level in terms of abstraction, right? Like you've got your operating system on top, the lower levels you go, you've got your RAM, your CPU, your like circuits, and then your, like, your logic gates, your ones and zeros. So computer engineering focuses more on the low end. Uh, and I'm not too, uh, I'm very interested. It's all very interesting when I like something like low end pops up on my YouTube feed, but I'm not a specialist. I wouldn't be able to give you a very, in-depth understanding on the computer engineering part. Can you link your LinkedIn profile? Yes, uh, maybe if someone from the committee could do that, that'd be great. I continue answering questions. What's your advice on work life? Like to what extent are we allowed to look for codes in Stack Overflow, bro? <laughs> bro, like the whole job's looking at Stack Overflow. Like they don't expect you to know everything. Why uh, there's, there's no programmer that can know everything. Every single programmer uses Stack Overflow. Like, and the hard, the more you climb in CS, like the harder your tasks get, right? The harder your tasks get, bro, the more you go on Stack Overflow, the harder your tasks get, the more you look on Google and Stack Overflow. That's, that's what I've seen um, through my experience. And like, it's what's worked for me. 
uh, thoughts on going into academia for data science, AI, and some industry? That's a very good question, actually. Uh, depends with data science, it's a bit tricky because you kind of have to find a field to latch onto. Like some people find it in bioinformatics, some people find it in cybersecurity, uh, some people find it in, uh, like by academia, do you mean furthering the research of another field? Or do you mean furthering the research of data science in particular? The last three questions, thank you for the questions. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, I shouldn't have, okay, 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 I'll just quickly say like, could you go back to the other? I accidentally click on. <laughs> oh, it's okay, it's okay. Um, uh, I think, oh yeah, I think it's still oh, can. It's gone. Yeah, oh, I... there we go. Oh yeah, thoughts, data Academia, wait till you graduate and then decide if you wanted to go do a PhD, you do a PhD. Otherwise, go into industry. You can always leave the industry and go back and do a PhD later. That's my plan anyways. I'm going to be working in the industry for like, as many years as I feel until I feel like I'd, I'd be willing to contribute or ready to contribute anything to academia. Can you sing for us? What qualities do you think will make one stand out among other candidates when HR is going through resumes? I wouldn't be able to tell you, man. It's random. It's it's like a it's a crapshoot. You just like apply as many places as possible. The more experience you get, the higher up your CV will be on the stack, essentially. So just keep grinding it out, man. The first few years are the worst. They're the absolute worst. But once you get over that that junior gap, like once you're recognized no longer as a junior, it completely changes, and that only comes with experience. Okay. Uh. What why some candidates can achieve so much in a short time. I tried 24 seven, but still can't match their potential. Uh, maybe like study technique, maybe not focusing on the right projects for the right type of jobs you're applying to. Let's say you're applying to a machine learning job, but you only have data science projects or vice versa. Or yeah, like there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Uh, if you really still are stuck, please do reach out to me. I'd love to help, you know, get to a little bit more information about your specific situation and, you know, see, See if there's anything that we could do. Yeah. Why? Okay. Thanks for spending so much time to explain for us. No worries at all. I mean, I've, I've been holding in my pee for a little while, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, I'm glad that there are so many people with questions, honestly. I owe any chance of joining Tech Club. I haven't reviewed my membership yet. Yeah. Um, I think I'll, I'll take this. So basically, um, what we're looking to do is um, having exclusive events for members and bonding sessions, and as well as moving forward to physical events where most likely those events will be paid for members, you have a discount on all those paid events. And especially web launch, like web launch was free for members, but paid for non-members. And it'll be the same for, for phase two. So yeah, that's pretty much it. And I think that's 